Okay, Cheryl Calderwood, the Board of Selectmen's meeting for Tuesday, October 20th, 2015. I'd like to start the meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Executive session was listed on the agenda this evening, but we did actually not hold it. So uh, this is the commencement of the entire meeting tonight. Uh, we'll start this evening, as we always do, with a public forum. Residents are invited to share ideas, opinions, or ask questions regarding time government. Do we have any takers? Chairman Lamb. Oh, it is. OK. So we offered up a uh, public session. Uh, no one was here to make comments, so we'll move right on from that. To consent agenda. A uh, number of action items tonight. First item in the consent agenda is appointments. The board will consider approving the following committee appointments. Barry Rosenblum to the Upper Charles Trail Committee as an at-large member from his current position as an associate member to complete a three-year term to expire June 30th, 2016. Bob McGuire is a temporary member of the Permanent Building Committee as a representative from the Parks and Rec Commission for the Fruit Street Auxiliary Facility. Item two is a marathon fund request. The board will consider approving a marathon fund request for the Hopkinton Senior Center for $2,000 for supplementing payment of fitness classes for seniors. Uh, does anyone like to break out any of the items of consent agenda? Item one, please. Okay, uh, so uh, might as well just take them in order then since we're on two. So, um, Mr. Katina, uh, Mr. Katina, Mr. Sistar, what's your question? Uh, I just want to uh, check to make sure these items were posted, these positions were posted. Yes, they were Thank you. Okay, anybody else any questions on item one? Chair, I'll entertain a motion to appoint Barry Rosenblum to the Upper Charles Trail Committee and Robert, Bob McGuire as a temporary member of the Permanent Building Committee as their rep to, for the Fruit Street Auxiliary Facility. So moved. Second. We have a motion with a second for further discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Present not voting. That passes unanimously. Item two is the Marathon Fund Request. Um, Chair, I'll entertain a motion to approve the um, uh, $2,000 to supplement payment of fitness classes for seniors. So moved. Second. Motion second. Further discussion? One in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? President not voting. That passes unanimously as well. Mr. Chairman, I would just like to just make a quick note that uh, it's amazing how, how far the senior center is able to stretch their dollars. And programs like this are really good for the seniors. And uh, uh, just it's just nice to see this continue uh, year over year. Thank you for that, Mr. Sestari. All right, we now have a gap until the Pratt Farm Master Plan appointments. Do we have anybody coming in for that? Yes. Do we know? We do. So we need to wait on that. Okay. Um, and can we get the, DUI, the, um, the family presentation uh, individual to come here early? Yes. It will be done while we're here early. Hi, would you like to come up on up now? I okay. Good, so what we're going to do is we're going to skip ahead to item six in the agenda, which is the Department of Youth and Families presentation and discussion. The board will hear a departmental update from the Department of Youth and Families Director, Denise Hildreth. Welcome back. How are you? Thank you. So Thanks I have just a few little handouts for you. They're all the same. Awesome. Thank you. So it's been a while since I've seen you since I first started in my position. I appreciate having a chance to come and see you again to talk about the program. Sorry. Yeah, stay there. Yeah, stay um, there. You're penned in. Sorry? You gotta stay there. You're penned in because of the microphone. So I will stay put. I usually wander about a little bit. Um, so I have sort of a quick presentation just to guide the conversation, but I hope you'll ask me questions as I go, and then there'll be time for you to ask questions at the end as well. So um, so as you know, I came into the program June 1st with um, a bit of a, a clean slate because the program had been shut down for some time since December when my predecessor uh, had left. And so uh, the beginning of my time in the program was really just kind of determining what the goals of the program were going to be, what the key initiatives are going to look like, and how are we going to go forward and do business. So here you'll see just the, sort of the four very broad stretching goals that I determined with some assistance from Norman and others who were, you know, key informants in determining how this program was going to be restructured. So. Very simply, um, the first part obviously is creating a strong community presence as a resource, ally, and partner. And I'll go through each of these in turn. Creating a departmental infrastructure for micro, meso, and macro service provision. Provide excellent clinical services to families. 
and then create macro level programming that responds to wider community needs. So those are the four sort of broad stretching goals that we sort of set out uh, to accomplish over the last four months. Sorry. So you'll see um, one of the big key initiatives in the beginning was sort of spreading the word about the program, letting folks know that we were here, and to really um, engage in a process of, in, in many ways, rebranding and revisioning what the department would be because formerly, as I'm sure you know, um, the program was called Youth Services. The term family was not included in that. And so Norman and I had a good conversation. I had conversations with others about um, the messaging that it sent to include and to change the department's name to Youth and Family Services so that it sent the message that we weren't just about adolescents, that we were really about kids and families at all levels of ages and schooling and in various compositions of what family can look like. And so this is our new logo, which really, you know, I spent lots of time kind of thinking over what this uh, picture represents. And really what it's meant to represent is the spirit of working with youth, working with families, and really having the community as the anchor for the services that are provided. So it's really anchored in a spirit of community, that the community is really behind families and um, their overall well-being and health. Um, so a, a huge push sort of immediately after we had this rebranding going and we were really thinking about how we wanted the program to look um, for really wide community outreach. So I spent most of my time not in the office but out on the road checking in with lots of folks because um, the idea behind it is that nobody would be able to say, I didn't know that the town offered this program, I didn't know about you or anything like that. So really to get the word out all over the place so that everybody knew that the program was back and what the program was intending to do. And side by side that, obviously, was strong public relations, really sending the message that this is a program that's here, that's accessible, that's open, that's available. Um, so I pretty much um, scattered myself around all over the place between the school system, the fire department, the police department, the senior center, project just because. Um, Anywhere that you can really think about it, I was on the road sort of canvassing, showing up, talking with people in person so that they could have a good sense of who I was and also what the program could offer. Um, part of the success of a program like this is that people um, see me as accessible, see my face, have a chance to meet me and really get a sense of um, being able to trust me with whatever it is that they might come forward with. Um, and then partnerships and relationships with key community service providers and stakeholders. So as I said, really talking with the people that are most likely to make referrals of families and individuals that are in need and developing a partnership of trust and respect so that they feel confident and comfortable sending people our way. Feel free to stop me if you have questions at any point. Um, and then obviously creating a departmental infrastructure for service provision. So because in any um, department that's been closed down for a little bit of time, and especially because I did not overlap with Jean, um, I didn't have a clear sense of exactly how she had done things before. And so there was a lot of kind of figuring out how we wanted things to look, how we were going to provide services. And so everything from um, me really figuring out what the Youth Commission was looking like, what they wanted from me, how I could best serve them, how we would best interact and work with one another, other important town departments, especially the school system, because that's the system that I'm most likely to interact with in addition to the police department and some others. Um, developing some basis, basic processes for how the departmental work would happen. Um, everything from developing forms, really being thoughtful about when a family calls or an individual calls, um, how are those calls handled, how are those emails handled, how, is, how, how are the services really provided. So thinking about how that would look. Um, and then managing just basic logistics of how other programs look in surrounding towns. I spent a lot of time meeting with lots of towns that have similar programs, what their structure looks like, what types of services they provide, and how they provide them. And then obviously creating policies, procedures, and forms that are important for the work. So now getting to the um, much more interesting part. Um, key piece, the, the anchor of what we do is providing excellent clinical services to families. And so some of the, you know, what excellent means to me and the ways in which my vision of how we provide excellent service takes place is, um, first of all, making the response um, timely. So if a family emails or they call and they need some sort of support, that they hear from me that day or within 24 hours and then I make a direct con connection with them, invite them in and have them feel like they're being heard very, very quickly. Client driven, so um, one of the hallmarks of social work practice and certainly the hallmark of my practice has been that clients really see themselves as the experts in their own situation. I have expertise in lots of areas, but a, a client and a client's family, they have expertise on their family. And so really they're the people that are driving the process and I'm kind of a navigator and an assister. Um, and it's really 
uh, a process that's built on respect, respect for what they bring to the table, for the strengths that they have, and what it is that they're looking for. Easily accessible. So, um, you know, some families are able to come to the office. Some families feel comfortable doing that. Other families don't, and other families aren't able. So if a family says, you know, child care is really difficult for us, is it possible for you to come to my home? I see a number of families in their homes. They don't have to travel to me. They don't have to get child care, particularly if their kids um, have some challenges that would make child care difficult. I'll meet people at Dunkin' Donuts. I'll meet them at the school. Wherever it is, is uh, that they most want services is where I'll be. Obviously confidential, that kind of goes without saying, but for families to really feel a sense of trust that even though I'm a resident of town, even though I have kids in the school system, that uh, nobody knows about the work that we do together, my family, anybody else, that they really can um, rely on that. Strength-based, so again, a hallmark of the way in which I do business is first looking at family strengths and individual strengths, and sometimes they'll come into a meeting and I'll ask them that strengths question, what are your strengths? I've heard a lot about problems and challenges. And they'll say, we don't have any, or they'll say, nobody ever asked us that. And so it's my job to help them to figure that out, help them to identify those things, and sometimes to unearth strengths that they don't realize they have. Again, um, people can't really move forward in addressing issues and problems if they don't have anything that they can anchor in strengths. And then meeting an array of needs. So, um, you know, the pamphlet that I passed out for you to take a look at really describes the types of needs and the areas in which we focus services. So um, sometimes families come in just strictly for consultation. This is what's going on in the family. I spend an hour talking the situation over with them. They have some direction, and I might not see them again, or they might check in with me in a week to make sure that they were hooked up with the resources that they needed or the conversation went okay. It's a, it's a sense of really guiding them, but it's not necessarily an ongoing um, service provision type relationship. Lots of families come in for things like resource and referral. So um, we do have families in town, as you well know, that are, um, have financial needs, that have an array of other types of needs, where what they're looking for is assistance with things like, you know, I'd really like my daughter to do cheerleading, but we have no money to pay for it. Is there a way that you could help me to figure that out? Um, and so that's a very easy thing for me to accomplish, but sometimes families don't know what direction to take to make that happen. So um, lots of resources and referrals to other service providers around things that can be pretty quickly fixed up. Um, case management. So one of the things about sort of the contemporary way in which social services are delivered is that often families and individuals have a lot of service providers, but nobody at the center to coordinate the type of care that's going on. So they might have doctors, psychiatrists, therapists, teachers, um, other care providers, but they need someone at the center of that to coordinate that team, to get the team together, to have everybody meet together, get on the same page, and make sure that nobody's falling through the cracks. So that's another role that, uh, you know, is a real luxury to have someone in town that fulfills that role. And then a lot of what I'm doing is um, social work, clinical services, so ongoing clinical work with individuals, couples, families. So um, the boundary that I've drawn around what's my job is if it has anything to do with the strengthening and preservation of families. So in some cases that means it's a couple that's dealing with quite a bit of marital conflict and what they really are looking for is couples counseling and so I'm providing that type of counseling on an ongoing basis even though I'm not directly working with the kids. The intention and the aim is around strengthening the family for the benefit of the kids. Um, so I do see individuals on a weekly basis or on every couple of week basis, sometimes on a monthly basis. I see a fair amount of couples in their homes and at the office on a weekly basis. And then um, the great thing about a job like mine is I don't have an insurance company or anybody else telling me how to do the job. And so if I say, you know what, let's meet a couple of times with you by yourself and let's have your parents come in for the third session. Or let's do a session between you and your dad. We really get to make those decisions about what makes the best sense. So I'm sort of seeing folks in all different types of arrangements, whatever makes most sense. Um, and so just to give you a, a little bit of sense of the service provision and the numbers and you know, what we're talking about you know, in, from a data perspective, um, my service hours have gone up 146% in September from previous months. So that also obviously speaks to the fact that people are back in school and schools are identifying needs and challenges that people are facing and the fact that people really know that I'm here now and sort of we're at a point now where the, the phone and the email are kind of um, ringing off the hook, which is a really good sign that people know this is a resource and are using it. Um, I have probably about 16 active families, so families that I see probably weekly or close to weekly um, to assist them with a variety of things that they're facing. I have some other families that I'm kind of monitoring that I don't see every week, but I'm keeping in touch with to make sure that progress is maintained. And then I usually have three to five families or individuals that are kind of pending, that I've made contact with, we've set up appointments, and I don't really know the nature of the services that they're going to need yet. 
Um, so just a sense of the numbers. And then group support. So I'm also offering a variety of ways that folks can get support, um, not in their home and not on an individual basis, but ways that they can come forward as a group of other people that are also facing similar challenges. So um, one thing that I do is every Thursday from 10 to 11 in the morning, I have a drop-in that people can just show up. They don't have to make an appointment. Um, and sometimes it's hard for people to make the step of making an appointment. They'd rather just show up because they know I'm sitting there. And I have had people drop in to talk about whatever it is that, that they're facing in terms of challenges in that way. Um, and I'm also offering groups around sort of common need areas, things like grief for teens, um, things like the challenges of adoptive parenting, things like being a member of the sandwich generation, um, you know, dealing with having to care for aging parents and also teenage children. So a variety of groups are being offered um, for folks to take advantage of if they want to kind of stop in, have a conversation with other people, um, and I facilitate that conversation. Any questions? I feel like I'm talking a little fast, sorry. Um, and so then macro level programming that responds to wider community needs. So offering things like regular informational educational forum, forums on a variety of topics to address specific need areas. So um, a good example of this is the Hopkinton Moms Group came to me and said, you know, a lot of us are talking about how challenging it can be to talk with young children about deaths that have occurred in our families and thinking about the ways in which children grieve. And we're, we're kind of unclear about exactly what to say to our kids. Could you offer something about that? So in November, we have an expert from um, an organization called the Children's Room in Arlington that's going to be coming to talk with parents about that. So that's a good example of something that, you know, if it comes forward to me that families are looking for it, I'll put together something that will address that need on sort of a macro level. And then <clears throat> other major initiatives to address key community challenges and problems. And I'm going to skip right to the next slide to give you the, the biggest example of what, what is going on with that. Um, so as I think you all know, there was a time in May when Norman was approached by Karen Spilka who said there's an opportunity for um, some money to be deployed in the town as part of the state budget if you can come up with some sort of a broad proposal around substance abuse prevention. And so um, I wrote a proposal and ultimately we were funded $100,000 this year, earmarked funds in the state budget managed by the Bureau of Substance Abuse Services. And so that has really taken off as a key component of my job. How are we going to be thinking about um, the best way to spend this money in our town to address the needs that we face? And so I get engaged in a process of talking with key informants at the state level, lots of folks around town who were immersed in the substance abuse field to think about what are the things that we're facing here, what are um, folks at the state level seeing, and how can we address those locally? And so we've identified sort of three key areas that we're going to be focusing our work, um, the first of which is coalition building. So <clears throat> last month, we had our first meeting of the Hopkinton Substance Abuse Prevention Coalition. It was attended by, I think, 24 people from many different aspects of our community, <coughs> from families in recovery themselves, to the district attorney's office, to Karen Spilka's office, um, people from the school department, the police, the fire department, pretty much anybody that you can imagine in town that has a stake in this type of work was there. And so it's been critically important for all of those people to get in the room to talk about um, what are we doing, what can we do differently, and what are the key areas that we want to use this money. It's not just a, a youth services initiative, it's a community-wide initiative that everybody should be taking advantage of. And so um, the other piece that we identified was prevention. So education and programming around a variety of topics that will help families to understand the nature of addiction and substance use um, a little bit more clearly. So something that's coming up is a conversation about opioid addiction, the risks and um, uh, sometimes signs of opioid addiction that families might not recognize. That's going to be happening at next week, actually. And then incentives for non-use. So we're going to be putting forth um, major campaigns at both the high school and the middle school at the $10,000 level to incentivize students around non-use. Um, so an example of what's going to happen at the high school is um, a fifth period or a fifth, fifth quarter initiative after three of the home basketball games. We're going to offer an opportunity for students to get together, have a DJ, food, games, prizes, to give them an alternative <clears throat> to using substances after games. So incentivizing students for good, good work, non-substance behavior. And then finally, um, this is an area that a lot of towns are not doing, that we want to take a little bit of a risk and try it out. 
um, an intervention and access to services branch of our initiative. So I'll just quickly describe them. The first is a Narcan initiative. So Narcan, as you probably know, is the drug used to reverse an opioid, a fatal opioid overdose that is used by police and EMTs on response. Um, we have um, laid the groundwork for a partnership with Hopkinton Drug. Hopkinton Drug already dispenses Narcan for a fee. Um, they have a standing order so that they can do it so a family does not have to come in with a prescription. They can simply say, I would like to get Narcan, I need it for my family, and they can have it dispensed. Um, the cost at this point is about $126 if a family wants that. And the cost can be prohibitive for some families to be able to afford it and they walk out without it. So what we would be doing is Hopkinton Drug would dispense the Narcan and ultimately bill me and the grant program at the end of each month for however many units are used. So that's a key piece. And then we've launched a Hopkinton Access to Coordinated <coughs> Treatment Team. So we're not providing treatment, but we are providing an avenue to reduce barriers to anybody in town who's looking for substance abuse treatment and support for whatever drug or alcohol, whatever it might be. It's not just around opioids, and it's not just for youth. It's for anybody of any age. Um, and we're probably going to be launching partnerships with AdCare Hospital in Worcester and Genesis Counseling in Framingham to assist us with that piece. Um, AdCare is for adults and Genesis is for people under 18. And so we've already had two referrals for folks looking for services, one last week and one this week. Um, so I'm in the midst of linking the person from this week up with services. The person from last week is well on his way to recovery and been linked up with a program. Huh, so that's that. The end. Good. Thank you very much. I went through it at a high rate of speed. Um, uh, let's see. I think this calls for many other people to start with. So I'm going to go to Mr. Hurt for questions. Three questions, if I could. Where is your office located? On the second floor, right down there. And how does that office work for you, um, location-wise? Is it okay? It's okay. It's okay. What would be better? Um, well, as the program expands, I think there will be a need for additional offices and additional space. The space that a lot of programs like this have is a little bit bigger. They have, I don't have a couch in my office. It would be nice to have a more comfortable seating arrangement and more space for toys and other things. Um, kids talk best when they're occupied by something other than just looking at me. And so I've done a great job with the space that I have, and I love it. I'm very happy with it. It's very inviting. But obviously, if it were bigger and we had more space, um, but that's not a pressing need at this moment. Okay. So keep us posted on that. If you need something, let us know. Um, Second question, if I could, Mr. Chair, yeah. one more to follow. Do we have any DCF cases in town? Are you connected with those, and are you following those, and mm -hmm. are you concerned about any of those? We do have DCF cases, and so I generally, well, okay, so I could make a referral to DCF if I felt that a child was in danger of neglect or abuse, and so I'm a mandated reporter. I have to do that. When families come in and we talk about confidentiality, that's the caveat to confidentiality that I tell them right up front. Um, if there is a concern about neglect or abuse, then I do have to make a report. That's not something that can remain confidential, and families understand that. Um, I have not had to make a referral to DCF for a protective case myself yet. That probably will happen at some point. Um, mostly I'm getting involved with cases that are already linked up with DCF and providing some sort of supplemental support to help the family through that process. Um, I've been working with the family, and um, DCF subsequently became involved in their lives after I had been working with them. And so I'm going to help to kind of shepherd them through the DCF process and provide additional support to make sure nothing else goes wrong. So I don't have any major concerns, but we do have families linked with DCF. Okay, great. Thanks. And last question. Um, as far as your relationship with the schools, the guidance department there, the police, fire, everyone, are you comfortable with that relationship and that everyone's sharing information and working uh, on what's be best for, for all the students and their families? It's been great. It's been great? Yeah. Um, I think once people knew who I was and had a sense of trust that I could um, help them and really be a resource and that I wasn't going to step on their toes or their job and I really knew what my boundaries were around where my job began and their job ended, um, they call me in. They call me in for meetings. They call me in for cases. They refer cases to me that they just can't quite handle in terms of the scope of their job. So honestly, I can't complain one bit about that. It's been great. Great. Thank you. I think you're doing a great job. Thank you. Okay. Mrs. Starry. Mr. Kamalo. <coughs> nice job. It's a fantastic, fantastic hire. Um, Denise, this is, this is fantastic. Um, You've come at this and you've put together such structure in this program, uh, incredibly comprehensive, yet uh, you know, I don't get the feeling that any of it is superficial, um, you know, simply because you've covered such breadth uh, 
you know, it seems like there's some real content here. And um, you know, I'm looking forward to seeing more of the results as, as you move forward. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, truly bowled over by this. So I'm uh, looking forward to seeing more as, you're, as you continue to uh, un unwrap some of this and, and it really kicks into action. Um, I know that a lot of what you do may, uh, may be difficult to measure in terms of you know, metrics and things like that, but as you continue, if you can uh, be keeping in mind some of the metrics that we might keep, uh, keep a, a hold of, this seems like the type of thing that it's getting set up to expand pretty rapidly in town. And, uh, you know, one of the things that we've had in the past is, as you know, very limited resources in this area. So it's something where if we're going to be asking the townspeople uh, to consider expanding the scope of this department, uh, we need to be able to have something where we can show them the benefits. Sure. And, uh, and if it's attached to some type of, you know, real metrics that, that we can present, you know, then it makes it that much easier. Yeah, I'm so, happy to do that. But uh, great job. Thank you. Best job I ever had. Mr. Catino. <clears throat> Excellent. I remember when, when um, you were appointed, uh, I said to you, you had some big shoes to fill because your predecessor really did a, a fabulous job. And I am absolutely blown away with what you've done in, in less than a quarter. Um, and then and it, to be able to manage the, the $100,000 so well, and it's, it's very well set up. Um, the care management, that was the thing that got me most. It was actually one of the smaller ones. But to me, you know, having somebody that uh, can manage cases for people because it gets so difficult when, when somebody might have different uh, areas that they have to coordinate, make sure they hit the right ones at the right times, and having those phone calls come in, did you remember to go to this meeting? You know, to have you there to, to do that for them must be just wonderful for these people. So thank you very much. Fabulous, fabulous support. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Good. Um, so we, I'll look at everything everyone said. Nice start, terrific presentation. Thank you very much. You worked on a lot. The only thing I want to ask about is, do you do long-term clinical interactions with people? Mm -hmm. And is that something that is commonly done in this role, I guess? I, 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 I like everything I heard, except I, I start to get a little, a little anxious when you, when you talk about how you're doing lengthy counseling. Sure. Um, with individuals, yeah. uh, you, can you explain? I mean, is that is that really what you're doing? And can you explain why sure. why you think it fits in the mandate? Yeah. So, I, well, first of all, I don't keep everybody. So, people might come in for clinical services, and I might refer them. So, the way I kind of draw the boundary around my role is, um, if it's something that can be accomplished in about a year's time, that's a case that I can keep. Um, if it's a case with long-term major mental health and advanced eating disorder, if there are things that are very, very serious, those are cases that I'm usually going to refer out. Um, if I know the family or the family is acquainted with my kids, those are cases that are getting referred out. So there's also a boundary around you know, how well they might know me because I'm a person in town with kids. Um, but yes, that is what is typically done in programs like this. Every program is a little bit different, but for example, Holliston, the bulk of the work that they do is long-term clinical work. They do much less of the macro-level programming and things like that. Um, I really see the role, my role, and the role that I want to have in town is really the micro, meso, macro. I don't want it to be only doing counseling. I really want to be able to do the programming and managing grants and things like that. But there are programs where the bulk of what they do is long-term right. clinical work. Right. But again, but I, I don't know that I think that was what the intent was and I guess I, I just get anxious about that because well I don't know that I agree that it's a, a service best provided by the government okay. B I worry about confidentiality right because now we've got a bunch of files in town hall that we have to we have to protect we have to maintain right if, if you if you move on we got to figure out to do with all those things sure. I worry about having people in that those sessions again just to coming into your office part of the whole thing so I, I get I uh, you know philosophically and pragmatically both I I, w I personally, at least, will have some level of concern if that becomes a meaningful proportion of your time. Because I do think you outlined an, an outstanding set of activities that you can pursue and that you are pursuing. Mm -hmm. So I think in terms of the benefits to the entire community, sure. those are the highest value add anyway. And certainly I, I, I like the fact you put some bumpers around it. But again, I just I, I, I think if, if this is going to become a counseling-driven enterprise, then I would 
believe that that's, not, that's a conversation that has, has to come to the town manager, certainly, and probably back to the board from a policy standpoint to talk about if this is really a business we should be in as a town. Okay. And so I, I, you know, if it's on sort of a, not quite one off -y, but, you know, like less, less active basis than I guess, I still have concern, but I have less concern than if it becomes a, a bigger enterprise. But again, we really do need, if you're going to engage in that kind of activity, A, we need to make sure that we're all on board with it, and B, we need to make sure that we're scrupulously following all the rules attached to it. Because again, I know, I, I don't know what the liabilities are, but I know there's liabilities associated with, you probably get HIPAA, you probably get a whole bunch of other stuff we've right. got to be thinking about. I worry that we have liability if you're, if you're counseling someone and that goes wrong in some fashion. I don't know that we've thought through that. So I think if, if, if counseling is going to be an active part of your activities, again, I, in my opinion, you should stay small, and I do want to make sure we, we button up all these, these details, Mr. Kamal, that I don't know we've ever thought through before. HIPAA is an enormous, I mean, I know physicians, HIPAA is an enormous burden, and I, if that subjects the town to this, we need to be really careful about that. So that's all I would say. Yeah, I, I mean, so I, I, I like everything. Sure. I like everything. I just I don't want to blow this in some spectacular fashion um, for for a small portion of your role. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, anything else on the board? Mm -hmm. No. Nope. Okay. Good. Thank, Thank you. you so much for coming in. We'll Thank look you. Thank you. Take care. Can we um, can we make sure we look into all these items and, and address this stuff? Okay. Let's make sure we have an answer for all that at some point. Okay, we're going to move on to the next item, which I have to bring up because I was reading the presentation. Um, the Pratt Farm Master Plan appointments. It's an action item. The board will consider appointing the individuals to the Pratt Farm Master Plan Advisory Group. And these appointments are a DPW appointment, an at-large appointment, an Upper Charles Trail Committee appointment, a Scout Association appointment, and a Board of Selectmen excuse me, representative. We have one applicant for what I believe, Mr. Kamala, was the at-large appointment. Um, and that individual is in the room tonight. Uh, and knowing him, I will ensure we we'll have to thoroughly vet him. He's a questionable character. And so, um, uh, so can we, uh, Ms. Kamali, do you want to talk about the applicants we have and, and uh, what exactly, which ones we were ready to appoint this evening? Yes, through the chair. Uh, let me go down the list. The Department of Public Works appointment, uh, I have been working with this, uh, an individual <coughs> in town who, um, just reported to us that after considering the position, they were interested, but now because they're moving out of town, uh, they will not be yeah. able to That's not okay. So, okay. So we do not have a job. Drawing, yes, we're okay. going back to the drawing board. Back to the drawing board on that one. But can we just stay on that for one sec? Um, but was that a Department of Public Works individual? No. Was that another at large? Because we're talking about the Department of Public Works, so I'm not clear what, who he's talking to. See what I'm saying? I do see what you're saying. Do you want to answer it? I mean, I know the answer, but you want to go ahead. Okay. Um, the intent was to identify an individual with related expertise to the uh, Department of Public Works relative to water. Yeah. Because you want to drill for water. Okay. So it's somebody it. from that world. We want someone who knows it doesn't how have to be well. somebody yeah. in the DPW. Gotcha. Right. Okay. That makes someone sense. who knows how wells work. That's good. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so we're off the, we're off on that appointment tonight. The at large is Mr. Murphy? Yeah, Mr. Murphy. <clears throat> okay. We'll come to him back to him in a minute. Upper Ch Charles Trail Committee, do they have somebody? We, yes. We believe a name is forthcoming. Okay. Um, we were hoping to get the name before okay. tonight. But we don't have a name. name. Okay. Yet. Scout Associate. This is going like a well-oiled machine. Scout Association appointment. <laughs> oh, for three. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Maybe oh, for three. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to be chairman. <laughs> <laughs> chairman of himself. <laughs> Scouts yeah. were going to get us one tonight, but they didn't get it to us yet. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Okay. We're expecting and, an email. Shortly. And then the board selecting representative, we'd have to discuss that among ourselves. Okay. So since so if the, if folks come back to us with names tonight, because they promised we would, right? Then we'll we'll revisit this. On the agenda later, if you get if you get a late breaker. Yes. For now, since Jim Murphy's here, want Jim, you want to come on up to the podium and introduce yourself? And um, uh, yeah, no, since he's not here, I think he's the obvious candidate. Yeah. So, welcome. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jim Murphy. I reside at 24 Longwood Drive. Um, I've been in town for my family and I have been in town for about 13 years. Um, I have three sons, all in the school uh, system varying ages from high school all the way down to um, Elmwood. Uh, my interest, I guess, in this position, I, I kind of stumbled upon. I didn't really, well, I, I follow 
town activities kind of as much as my time allots, but this one kind of piqued my interest because it's literally in, in our backyard uh, in Woodville. So, you know, obviously Longwood Drive is right down the street from Fruit Street and the property, uh, the Pratt Farm property. Um, it interests me because I'm, I'm constantly out and about in the area. Uh, Whitehall is right down the street. I'm running around the trails all the time. Um, I also enjoy winter activities. So this was, you know, obviously kind of an extension of that. Um, and really that's pretty much my only interest, or my interest in, in serving in this committee. Okay. I'm an avid outdoorsman. Uh, I don't bring any expertise as far as, you know, water is concerned or DPW, but uh, definitely uh, have an interest in the land and um, in the outdoors. Yeah. Let's go to the board here for uh, the questions. Mr. Coutinho, you want to start? Yeah, great. I, you know, you're just the kind of candidate we were looking for, for uh, well, I was looking for, for a that large person, you know, with a broad interest in having, having kids do the school system that would uh, be able to use that property. You, you, you know, 13 years, you know the area and everything else. It's, uh, I really appreciate just stepping up. Uh, you know, just, yeah, you can be chair. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Mr. Zistari. Um, yeah, thanks for stepping up. I appreciated your letter of interest as well. And um, it's good to, I think, have someone in there who is from the, from the immediate area uh, kind of watching out, watching out for the neighborhood as well. Uh, I mean, I think that this is going to be, overall, it's going to be all positives. Uh, you know, I can't see anything uh, negative about the project, uh, but it'll be good to make sure that there's a local voice uh, for that area. So, Thank thanks. And Mr. Hur. A uh, couple of things. One, Jim mentioned it's in his backyard. He is not an abutter to the property, uh, to be clear. Uh, so there's no conflict there uh, at all that I can see. Uh, that said, I think he's a great fit and uh, wholeheartedly endorse him joining the committee. Okay. I've known Jim as long as I live in town. We're friends. So he's a neighbor. So uh, a couple houses down. So I, I, I don't have anything to ask. Um, I know he'd be a great candidate for the committee. So um, with that, do you have anything else to say? No, I don't. Thank okay. you. Okay. Motion to appoint. So, right. Chair Lantana, motion to appoint Jim Murphy as the at-large member, I guess, is what we want to do, Mr. Kamala, right? Yes, yes. As the at-large member of the Pratt Farm Master Plan Committee. Second. Advisory group. Sorry. Advisory group. Second. Oh, we need a motion. Still. I said you motion to Motion. Yeah. Second. Any further discussion? Last chance. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Present. Not voting. That's unanimous. Welcome to, welcome as the inaugural member, in fact, <laughs> of the Pratt Farm Master Plan Advisory. One Hopefully we'll flesh this out a little quick, quickly. So. Thank you very much. If you had a quorum, you could vote yourself. <laughs> so what you, what you do sure. is you just, um, you just report downstairs to Jerry, get, get sworn in, and then, you know, we'll, there'll still be emails coming along. Okay. So that would be tonight before I leave or just when I... She's not here. Yeah, she's not here. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Jim. Jim, we'll follow up. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks, Tom. Thank Thanks, Jim. Thanks Thank very you. much. Okay. So we may revisit this if we get names from the other committees. There were two committees meeting tonight, I think, right, that were going to uh, uh, potentially forward candidates. Okay. Once tomorrow. Uh, quick. I nominate Mr. Moser. Twice. Second. Take the vote. All right. On favor, Mr. Moser is this one. the newest member of the Garbage Commission. So, uh, we can certainly, since we have all, all our people, I feel really woefully underdressed here tonight. Um, uh, right, so we have a Board of Selectmen representative to appoint. John, we're picking up here an item eight to see another Pratt Farm Master Plan appointment. We just picked Jim Murphy as the large, large member. Since you showed up, we could actually talk about the Board of Selectmen's representative to the committee. Does anyone like, would anyone like to express an interest in being part of the Pratt Farm Master Plan Advisor Group? Um, Mr. Chairman, I would. I would actually uh, suggest that if you have interest that uh, you be the representative. I know you've been really uh, involved in this throughout the process and if, uh, you know, I know, that, I know that as chair that takes an extensive amount of your time, uh, but if you feel that you have the time and the interest, I would suggest you. Um, thank you. Do we have anyone else who would like to compete for this position of the illustrious Pratt Farm Master Plan Advisory Group? I would support Mr. Sisteri's suggestion. I think you've worked hard for it, Ben. Yeah, you need a microphone. Uh, I guess not. I, I also understand if, if you feel that you're already crunched for time. I'm not trying to put pressure on you for no, that. No, I, I, so I, I, okay, so as, an, as a member of the board, I, I, I genuinely thank you for that. I will do it if nobody else wants to come forward. However, I, I am very, very busy, and I am utterly not um, uh, 
you know, seeking this role actively. So, sure, yeah. If, if you, if you really, if no one else wants to do it, of course, obviously I'll step up and I'll do it. But I really am not uh, vying for this job actively. I'm, I'll be completely pleased if someone else wants to. Do it. I, I, for me personally, I would say that um, my other logical choice, and again, not to put pressure on the person, but would be Mr. Mosier. Um, but I know that he's quite a busy guy as well, so as we all are. But. Uh, split it, then. Rock, paper, scissors, two, two out of three. Is there way we can split it, Norman? Not really. You guys got to do it. The promise is not going to be that long. Yeah, I still have the elementary school building committee. Yeah, yeah red light. Red light. Yeah. Well, we could go to Mr. Yeah, I got Hall. the red light. Why don't we dump it on Mr. Hall? Um, what are you guys going to do? So, so I'm, I'm happy to help if you guys can't get there. But if one of you wants to get there and be the appointee, that's, I mean, I'm willing to do whatever you want to do. If one of these guys wants to do it, that's fine, too. But I think you, don't, you shouldn't feel like you have to do it because we're, like, just sitting here looking at you. Well, right. So I'm, I'm only doing it if nobody else wants to do it, to be, to be frank. I've got enough to keep me busy in my life. So um, if anybody wants to do it, please speak now. Otherwise, I guess I'll, I'll, you accept, the, do it I'll accept the nomination. But. I'd do it if I had time. I just feel like, you know, I'm having trouble making meetings as it is. Given the hour at which you just arrived, yes. <laughs> All right, Chair, I'll entertain a motion to uh, to nominate an individual. So nominate the uh, chair. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't want to do it, speak up. <laughs> well, would you do it? I mean, would you? I would be it? happy to do it if you don't want to do it, but I don't have a strong opinion one way or the other. Um, I would be perfectly pleased if you would take it. If, can you remove your motion? I'll remove my, my motion. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to nominate Mr. Herr. Okay. We have a motion. Second. We have a motion to second. For a discussion, are you good with this? I mean, I don't, I don't want to force it on I'm you fine. just because no, I'm busy. I, I, I'm happy to do it. Okay. Thanks. Okay. We have a motion. We have a second. Do we have any further discussion, any further discussion before it changes his mind? I'd just like to say it'd be nice to have a true man of the people uh, on this I think, on this I think it's critical. I mean, really, this really calls for a man oh, yeah. who can really speak to the masses. All right. Let me note um, the time. <laughs> <laughs> good. Take the vote. <laughs> so you're good with this? You're good. I'm good. Okay. Thanks. So all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Present not voting. That passes unanimously. Mr. Herb becomes the second member of the Pratt Farm Master Plan Advisory Group. So, thank you for stepping up. I really appreciate okay. that. You. So, in this chair. So, exactly. <laughs> All right. So that's item number uh, six is finished for the moment. Um, we'll, as I said, we may revisit that if we get some. Um, names from committees that are currently meeting later on tonight. Let's skip on down to item 10. Mr. Kamalo, can you, 13 I mean, can you give us a firing, uh, chief hiring process update? Yes, um, in fact, the fire chief hiring committee met this morning uh, and um, we went into executive session to review uh, and screen the resumes that came in. Uh, we identified individuals uh, that would be invited in for interviews uh, and scheduled those interviews for the 9th of November. Okay. Uh, we also tentatively scheduled the second round interviews uh, the following Monday, the 16th. So process is moving forward. Um, I, I know the chair is scheduled to go back to the fire department to report on a survey that we, uh, we undertook. The chair of the hiring committee, you mean? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Anything for the board? It says action. Anything for the board to take action on? Uh, at this point, no action, I, no, no action is required from the board. Okay. Does anybody have any questions for Mr. Kamala about the fire, fire chief hiring process? Mr. Hiller. I may have missed this. Do we have a count? Or how many candidates do we have this time? Yeah. Um, I believe... How many are being interviewed? I believe we oh. may have received approximately 21 applications. Uh, and how many will be interviewed? Uh, at this point, I can report that seven will be interviewed. Seven will be interviewed. And how many are internal? Is that an appropriate question? I, I don't, I through the know. chair, I don't think at this, at this stage. That's fine. But it, of the 21, how many? No, of the seven. There's seven that we're going to interview. Have you, so you've met and deliberated and picked the seven? Yes, we have. I would suggest we might just want to let this lie for a moment. I'm happy to withdraw the last question. Thank you. 
Not for any reason other than just why I started going down the, the path. Yeah. Okay. Anything else, Mr. Hart? Nope. Anybody else got anything else? Are we still on track with? Uh, you, I'm sorry, John. Did you no, have I'm a good. question? Mm -hmm. um, are we still on track with hiring this, filling this role by end of the year? We think. Yes, I think based on the schedule I outlined, first round interviews on the ninth, second round interviews on the sixteenth. Yeah. Committee may be able then to schedule an assessment center mm -hmm. and then forward some candidates uh, to the selectmen uh, in December. Uh, hopefully, we'll meet the, the January uh, uh, deadline. Are we going to do that round robin? interview process again? I, I believe we asked for that specifically. Did we not say we want to do this exactly like the police chief where we have the final cans come in for a night of... And everybody gets room and we all talk to them. Yeah, I like that. Is that. That's the plan, right? That's the plan. It's a good plan. I like a plan. Okay. Uh, no other questions uh, on the fire chief. Let's go liaison reports. Mr. Sestari. I have nothing to report. Mr. Catino. I have none today. Mr. Mosier. Nothing at this time. And Mr. Herr. I met with the school, a couple of the school committee folks, and uh, who shares school committee with me? Is that me, Mr. Mosier? And actually, I mentioned it to him. Um, and they've asked us to be very uh, uh, visible and involved in the budget process for them, which is going to be uh, really going on, I think, pretty strongly in December, where the principals make the presentations to the school committee. Uh, so I committed to getting to those meetings in December. I asked that. Uh, uh, Dr. McLeod to help me and remind me, since we work in a similar area over there, uh, to get to these things because there's going to be a lot going on. Um, but I'm trying to commit, and I know Mr. Moser is doing the same, to be a little bit more involved up front. So when we get into March and April, when we're all sitting here saying, well, wait a minute, why is there 50 grand here and 30 grand there? We'll already have that answer for you guys so we don't sort of rehash things and drag this process on longer than it needs to be. So yeah. just want to let you know that we're going to try and step that up a little bit this year. Good. Okay. I saw an initial um, capital request list from them, and um, they actually paired it back a fair ways from what I recall, too. There, I think there's, there's discussion about having a field finally be on a warrant based upon a, which? Uh, a, a turf field. Turf field, yeah. So I think that's one, one big item. Is, uh, is There's been discussion of that. Um, I think that's based upon input from individual members on the board and other places. So I think that that'll be the big one. Okay, uh, uh, Mr. Kamala, anything for the town manager's report? Nothing at this point. Nothing at this point. No town manager's report. Okay, and then um, future board agenda items. Mr. Har, any agenda items? Not at this time, thank you. Okay, Mr. Mosier. No, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Catino. I, 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 um, this came up at the um, at, at Zach. Uh, we had a local landowner come in and start talking about parking. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's something that um, we should take up and look at areas in the downtown that that um, the town may be able to purchase a lease and see what we can do about uh, trying to uh, get this the initiative of the downtown revitalization going by uh, trying to get some parking going. Right. I mean, that has been an ongoing topic for a long time. I think I don't quite know how to put it on the agenda in the abstract. I think, um, uh, yes, we should move that forward. I think you're right. We should think about how to, how to have the conversation. Right. Exactly. So I agree with that. Yeah, let's okay. Anything else? No, that's it. Mr. Sestari. Nothing to request at this time. Okay. Uh, through yes, the sir. chair, yes, sir. I, coming back to agenda items, I would like at, at some point in your future to have some discussion around the intersection, uh, Main Street corridor again, mm -hmm. library parking kind of all is one cohesive discussion on the board and some of the long-term town objectives that we've had. So maybe we should have a, I mean, that ties Ms. Catino, so maybe we should tie like to a, to what, to a policy discussion about priorities maybe, downtime priorities maybe discussion? Um, right, the intersection, the parking, the other stuff. What, go ahead, Mr. Kamal, any thoughts? Yeah, if, if I may, um, as you know, uh, I think the last time the Main Street Corridor topic came to the board, um, there was a discussion regarding how the design could integrate uh, bike lanes. Um, I, I believe perhaps uh, any future discussion should receive a report from staff as to our findings regarding that particular topic. 
edition. Uh, in the past, we have discussed undergrounding of utilities. Uh, we have, uh, in the past uh, three, four months, been working on how best to, to address that issue. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and again, I think that would be a second topic that right. the board could cover uh, under the Main Street Corridor project. Right. All right, so why do we plan to do that? Why do we plan to have a lengthy some evening conversation about all those topics and maybe set priorities, um, try to get a, a sense of a board consensus on some of those things, some of which would be very expensive, right? Do we really want to pursue them seriously? And um, uh, see if we can, um, again, start to, start to give some direction and find out what we care about most. And I think that would tie in well with your Perfect. conversation. Okay, good. So that will be on the agenda uh, at some point in the next few meetings. Uh, hearing no other agenda items and awaiting a public hearing that we have to open at 7.30, the only other item on the budget, on the warrant tonight, ugh, on the agenda tonight is a special town meeting article positions, it's action items. Um, historically, the board takes positions on, on town meeting articles that we link to our areas of our purview. Um, I think pretty much everything on this warrant, with the exception of the zoning article, relates to us this year. So what we will do is um, go through each of these items and um, and discuss what the board wants to vote on them. Some of them we may either need to wait further information or um, take a vote contingent upon further information coming to light. But um, that's how we'll do this. Um, what I'd like to do for efficiency is just have a standing motion to inf to um, to vote to uh, in favor of the article. And so the chair would like to entertain a motion to um, establish a standing article uh, in favor of, uh, what, a standing vote rather, it, to support whatever article is under discussion at the time the vote is taken. So moved. Okay. Second. All right, so we have a motion, we have a second. So again, the, what we're going to do now is, um, is uh, vote on a motion to uh, be in favor of the article that is under discussion when I take the vote. So all in favor of that, uh, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, present not voting. Okay, so we've, we've established a standing motion uh, for each of these articles so we don't have to go through the whole process every time. And uh, not quite being 7.30 yet, uh, the first article on the warrant is the uh, school building project. Um, I got time to take a couple comments here before I open the warrant the meeting. So, uh, Mr. Mosier, as a member of the Elementary School Building Committee, would you like to um, uh, discuss or make any comments about su the board's support of the school building project? I think this project has been as well vetted as possible. I think it's been continually communicated uh, proactively out to the community and people of interest, and uh, I fully support it, and I hope I have the board's support as well. Okay. Mr. Catino, comments on Article 1? Yeah, I think we should uh, support it. It's, it's something that um, the uh, replacement activities are absolutely needed for the center school. Um, it, the, uh, it's been well vetted throughout the town, and um, uh, I believe it should be supported. Okay. Mr. Hart. We've been talking about the replacement uh, of center school for many years. We went through a very thorough process three years ago now, maybe four years ago, uh, that did not play out uh, at the time. Uh, we learned a lot, and I think the community has come back with a new plan and a new um, focus on how to make this work for as many people in Hopkinton as possible. It is a significant investment uh, in the community. It is expensive, uh, and it will impact our tax dollars to some extent. And we're going to let everybody know what those numbers are, of course. But uh, uh, you know, we can't we can't sit still as a community. I think we have to move forward. And I think this is, while expensive, an excellent investment for our community. And um, I'm eager to uh, get to town meeting and talk about it with the community. But uh, I, I look forward to a favorable vote then and at the ballot. Uh, but I do support it. Uh, in spite of the costs, I think that the return on investment for the taxpayers is real and solid, and that's why I support it. Okay. And Mr. Sestari, over to you. Yeah, you know, I agree with the rest of the board. I, I wholeheartedly support this. I was involved in the, in the uh, first 
attempt to, to bring a new school into town uh, or center school replacement, I should say. Um, you know, this is needed. It is expensive. Uh, and it is going to cost more in our tax bill each year, but it's also going to reap benefits both from uh, an educational and quality of education standpoint, uh, as well as safety of the school staff and the kids who are there uh, at the school, and then also right down to property values as well. Uh, so, you know, the schools are part of the foundation of what draws people to Hopkinton. It's a significant part. Uh, because they help to support uh, the, the property values in town. And so, uh, you know, this is going to further strengthen that foundation, and it's, it's something that we really need to do. I guess uh, one of the things I just want to be sure of is that everything is prepared and that uh, from an information standpoint, we're going to have all, the, all that information that people are going to be requesting, you know, exactly what the impact is on taxes, you know, what the recommendation is in terms of uh, financing this and things of that nature uh, because I want this to have the best shot possible uh, when we when we get to town meeting next week okay so in answer to your comment the last right there's been multiple run-throughs with the elementary school building committee about this whole thing it's really their show what we have is we have information on debt schedules that we'll be able to provide mm -hmm. we have a rough idea of the cost, and the reason I say rough idea is because there's a number of different options about how you, how you bond it over time. Mm -hmm. We don't need to make that decision for a long time yet, so obviously we, we wouldn't do that now. It's not part of the article. But we'll have, we'll have a midpoint number, and then yeah. it can be a little bit higher, a little bit lower, depending on what option we go through. And then we'll also have a discussion of the process we're going to follow with Center School. So I think those are the two big issues that the town has to really provide some answers on. So we'll have all that stuff prepared. As far as my, my views on this whole thing go, um, it's, it's time. It was time five years ago. It was yeah. probably time ten years ago. My only regret with this whole process is it took us this long to get back to this point. So I'm, I'm utterly unambiguously in favor of this, and I have been always. So um, with all that, because the hour is 7.30, um, all in favor of supporting Article 1 on the special time meeting warrant, say aye. 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 Opposed? President not voting. That's unanimous. The board supports Article 1 of the building project. With that, I'd like to go back to the agenda now. Uh, to a posted public hearing. It's a transfer of liquor license. It's an action item. The proponent is Siegels and Sons Investments Limited, DBA Marty's, location 61 Main Street, Hoppington, Mass. The board will open a public hearing to consider approval of an application to transfer a Section 15 all alcohol license for 61 West Main Street, Hopkinton, LLC, and forward to the ABCC for their affirmation, as well as consider approving a common victual license. There's a number of supporting exhibits uh, in the packet. Uh, Chair will entertain a motion to open the public hearing. So moved. moved. Second. Thanks. Okay. A lot of motions and seconds. Uh, for the discussion, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Present not voting. The public hearing is open. Um, greetings. greetings. Uh, welcome. Could I ask you both to, um, to introduce yourselves and uh, uh, start to talk about the project for us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Selectman. Karen Simeo uh, with the law firm of McDermott, Quilty & Miller. To my right, I have Mr. Martin Siegel, who is the sole shareholder and proposed manager of record at this location. Um, and I do apologize in advance for the large package, which as you know, the uh, licensing agencies are constantly evolving what they require in these packages. So I know that they can sometimes be cumbersome, but I will try to be as brief and succinct in my presentation as possible. Um, I know the board is familiar with the space that was formerly Colella's uh, market. Uh, and that that space did exercise a retail package store license at that location. The proposal before you today relates to a transfer of that license to Mr. Siegel. Um, by way of reference, I think that uh, there are very few licensing agencies throughout the Commonwealth that have had the um, experience of having someone with the depth and breadth of Mr. Siegel's experience in this area. Um, he has been in the business, as has the family, uh, for over 50 years now. And um, with that has been a very impeccable reputation. This is a very serious business, one that comes with a high degree of responsibility um, to the towns in which they are located. And that's taken very seriously by the family generally, but by Mr. Siegel in particular. Uh, many of you may be familiar with the two other locations. One is um, on the Austin-Brighton line, but the uh, long-standing location is the Newton location. 
Um, that location is much bigger than the plus or minus 3,500 square feet that we're talking about today. But I raise it because there will be similarities in terms of the concept. Um, this is not your average package store that uh, you may walk into in many other towns, and we're pleased by that, and we're pleased to be here in Hopkinton. Um, this is going to be, because the size requires it to be, the footprint is smaller, but a smaller version of what has been going on in Newton. And why that's important is because the nature and quality of the alcohol products being sold are at a very um, higher level um, than you'll see in a lot of other stores, as is, um, of course, the selection of specialty items. So um, there are very regularly pairings with wines, whether it's cheeses, whether it'll be olive oil, whether it'll be um, different staple items. Uh, so that concept that exists in Newton is what we would like to bring here to Hockington. And again, of course, a smaller scale of that because the square footage requires us to do so. Um, in terms of the concept, of course, that is what we're talking about uh, today. Physically, the location of that store, and I believe the board is familiar with this as well, will also be changing within the footprint of the building. So where the store was previously located on the left-hand side, the store will now be located on the right-hand side. That doesn't change things for, our, um, for the ABCC documents, but for the people in town to sort of know what to expect, if this is approved by the board um, geographically within the footprint, it will be changing slightly. Um, the hours of operation, of course, are um, in the package, as is all of the detailed information on the transaction. Um, we've submitted the uh, partial assignment of the purchase and sale agreement, which um, is the manner in which the license is being transferred actually from Colella's to Siegel and Sons Investments Limited. Um, and again, Mr. Siegel is available to answer any questions the board may have, whether it's regarding the operation or his experience in the business. Okay. And you are Mr. Siegel, I presume? Yes. Okay, welcome. Thank you for coming in tonight. Do you have anything you want to say before I go to the board? No. Okay, right. Let's roll it a roll. <laughs> okay. Uh, Mr. Moji, you want to start off? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I heard impeccable record in there in the introduction. Uh, so have you had any ser uh, underage serving violations or anything of that sort in any of your establishments? No. Okay. And any other issues of any, any kind, violations, anything like that we should know about? No. Okay. Well, that was a short and easy. <laughs> that was easy. And by reference, um, Section 12 and 13 in the ABCC application will also, which is signed under paints and penalties, um, reflect the responses on those um, questions as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Good. Chairman. I'm good. Mr. Sestari. Um, welcome. Welcome to Hopkinton. Um, so this would be uh, your, your third establishment that you have partial or whole uh, interest in? Correct. Or liquor license? Okay. Um, and as manager of record, uh, would, would the expectation be that you're here on a daily basis? Yeah. Okay. And um, because you're the manager of record, I just wanted to ask, uh, do you have uh, any convictions of operating under the influence, anything to that effect? Okay. And um, I just want to check with the chairman as far as the uh, change in where the business is done within the footprint of the current building and also the change in hours. Uh, this vote tonight has nothing to do with that or, or is it all bundled into one in our conversation? Isn't this, isn't that all that part of the application? So we're approving the application to send forward? That is correct. Okay. All the two topics that you identified, Mrs. Stare, are okay. covered in the current application. So is, is, is it a change in the hours of operation, or is it the same, opera, uh, same hours that were approved in the past? A change, I mean. We'll check on that. Okay. Um, that's... That's all I have right now. I have to take a look at the footprint, but I, I can't imagine there being anything there. So, um, so you're going to find that answer out for Mr. Sestari? Yes, all right, so we'll do that. Mr. Did you have a, did you do a corollary to his question? Or? Thank you again. In addition to, he started down the path, but I'd like to get the answer. I mean, some of the times we ask questions, it's in the packet, that's great, but we ask the questions so the public can hear the answers. 
verbally and, and live, so bear with us while we kind of repeat what's printed. Let but I'm interested, what are the hours of operation going to be? Well, that's what I was going to do. Can we talk about what your proposed hours are? We can. Um, the proposed hours of operation on Saturday are 10 p.m., uh, during the week 9 p.m., and on Sunday 6 p.m. Can you talk about when you open? Uh, 9 a.m. Yes, I just want to cross-reference what I have. I want to be consistent with what we've submitted. I'm sorry. Yeah, in, in, fact, in fact, the opening hours for the new operation are later than the prior. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So can we talk, just can we run, just for the record, can we say those hours? You're going to do that? Yes. Uh, day starting hours were Sunday, 8.30 a.m., Monday, 7 a.m., and in fact, this is Monday through Friday, 7 a.m., and then Saturday, 8 a.m. The new operation, the new operation, Monday through Friday, 9 a.m., Saturday, 9 a.m., Sunday, noon. Okay, and closing at? Closing day on Sunday, uh, close at 6 p.m. I think that's the law. Mm -hmm. so and then Monday uh, through, Thursday, yeah, through Saturday was 9 p.m. It was 9, right. That's when she closed all the shop. Yes. And as, I, as we said previously, in, this, in the new case, Monday through Friday, closing at 9 p.m., Saturday, 10 p.m., and then Sunday, 6 p.m. So it's 9 to 9 weekdays, it's 9 to 10 on Saturdays, and it's noon to 6, which is state on Sundays. Yeah. Yes. Are you satisfied with that answer? You can have a bunch of people waiting at your door in the morning. <laughs> 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 Not that this is a hard drinking town, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that would be a good problem, and we will be back should that problem exist. Okay. I have no more questions, Mr. Chair. You're good. Uh, your Carl has been answered. You're good. Mr. But mine's a little more specific. Who are you going to have running your wine department? Who's coming over from Newton? Yes, Peter. Oh, Peter's coming. You know Peter? I know Peter. He's very good. Excellent. Very, very knowledgeable. Yes. Yeah. 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 Good. I get his emails. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Very good quality organization. Thank you very much. No, I'm, I'm good. You're good? Okay. I got kind of a bunch of bounce around questions here. So, sure. um, go ahead, Mr. Yeah, I just was following on him. I've got oh, a few others. Sorry. Please, go ahead. Okay. So, uh, and to follow up, I think on what Mr. Moser was asking, and, and maybe you answered it, I, I, may not, I may not have heard it. Have you ever had any fines levied against you in your business operation over the years of any kind? No. No fines? No. Uh, and you've never been closed for any period of time, any suspended licenses, shut down for a day to kind of learn a lesson? Nothing Due to like any that. suspensions, no. Any closures have been, which probably you haven't even done any vacation closures, but there have been no, suspensions. no sanctions that have Got required it. any closures. No. Excellent. Thank you. Um, the entrance to the store, the new store, the store is moving to the right side of the building from the street looking at the, at the building? Yes. Uh, to the right side of sort of the uh, A-frame there? There will be a new entrance there, correct? Going in and out. Well, the entrance. In interior. interior. I'm sorry. The, uh, uh, the entrance, correct me if I'm wrong, is the, the existing entrance will remain. There'll be a vestibule area you, with a hallway, and you will go right down that hallway to enter into the store and left uh, down the hallway to enter into the, the other tenant. Other tenant, yes. Okay, from the other tenant space on the back side, will there be an entrance into the store as well? No. So there's, there's one no. entrance in and out of the store. Yes, that's and correct. And we'll make sure the building code works for all that. But in terms of yes. sort of safety and, and monitoring what's yes. going on, I'm not, think, I'm not thinking building code right now. I'm just thinking, You're just thinking flow of alcohol in yes. and out. It's just going to be that one entrance from the right yes. vestibule. Got it. Okay. Um, that takes care of that and that. The signage on the outside of the building, what is that going to look like? Where will it be? Have you made any of those decisions yet? Well, it's, uh, we were hoping to have a similar style that the Newton store has and, and the Alston Brighton store has. And uh, we can submit that to you. We, get, uh, we have a signage bylaw, and um, you'd have to get the specifics from the bylaw, and the planning department and the building department can sure. provide that. I, I know we don't do backlit signs anymore. Okay. Uh, so it would have to be sort of the incandescent or something shining onto the sign. So okay. just check into all that. We're kind that of sign. Be, that could be done easily. Yeah. From the kind of sign we have. Yeah. So just just be sure to follow that so you don't sure, spend money you can't recover. Thank you. All set. What do you mean you're set? You're set. Um, okay. So I got a few bounce around questions. Can you talk more about the business itself? Um, 
as background, recently the board declined to award a liquor license to an applicant in town because the board decided that the offering was essentially the same as in, in another liquor store, and so there was really no benefit to, to having this new liquor store from the, from the town's purposes. So, so you're, you know, you're opening up in proximity to another liquor store across the street, proposing to open up. So, can you just talk about your business? Why it's like what? What is? I, I've never been in the store, and so for the folks in the record, can you talk about what you do there, what you want to do? I know you have food involved, and it sounds like it's sort of higher end wine. Can you just sort of run through all that for us? Sure, yep. please. Uh, can you go to the mic? Can you hear him, Mike? Yeah, you can, can you can you go to the microphone when you speak? Yep, just absolutely. Um, we have always, for years, uh, focused on being unique and quite different. Uh, we call it not being a me too store. Uh, we're going to probably carry a lot of different things that the store across the street doesn't have and doesn't care about having. Um, like this is the kind of things that we like to bring our customers' uh, attention to. Uh, other things, other than, you know, the big mainstream brand names, if you will, and satisfy them completely on what we do have. That's what the Newton store is all about. It's a, it has a vast selection of product. We do want to maintain everything that everybody wants, so we're not, we don't discontinue those things, but we, we want to bring attention to the things that are unique and interesting and quite different than what they've been experienced before. Mm -hmm. So, uh, again, we don't want to be a Me Too store. We don't want to be the same as others. We want to be different. So what will you stock? Like, what, what will you have that makes you not a Me Too store? I'm sorry, say again? What will you stock? What will, be, what will, what will make it not a, like, what, high end wines or is it, you we know, have, we gourmet have, food or what? We have or shopped or what? the world for the most unique wines okay. and, and covering all price ranges. Uh, the, one of the newest ones we just got in is from South Africa. It's uh, a whole line of all the varietals of quality wine mm -hmm. for $3.99 a bottle. And it, 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 the people are thrilled with it. I mean, it's, you know, this is good everyday stuff. Mm. And, uh, you know, it's a value of, of $10 plus wine that's $3.99. Um, and that type of thing. This is the kind of thing we do. And carrying all the real... Uh, sort of hard to get stuff. Okay. Whether it be uh, liquors, beers, we carry a tremendous amount of craft beers mm -hmm. uh, that are very interesting, hard to find, hard to get. This is the kind of stuff we like to have. Do you, will you have food in the store? Yes. And what uh, would that be like? Uh, a lot of it will be shelf stable and we will have some refrigerated items as well such as cheeses and uh, spreads and things of that sort and sausage meats and yeah. whatever. Yeah. Okay. Whatever we can fit in there, we will because we, we love the food business. The food business is, we feel, again, makes us different than the average. Yeah. So, and, okay, so looking at the plan, of the 3,500 square feet, you know, I, I'm not an architect. I'm not in anything of that sort. So, so um, how much of that, like what percentage of it is, is sort of um, storage space and not, not open to the public versus actually selling space. Do you know? Just kind of roughly. I just want to get a sense of... On the floor plan that big, you have yeah. in front of you, yeah. so this is the floor plan they have, can't see the vast the majority of that is all selling space. Yeah. That's not storage space. And so There is some additional um, smaller storage space if you look at the left-hand side of that plan behind the beer, wine, cooler, and so you can always be more efficient in back space, of course, right. um, and creative with um, small space. Right. Um, so there'll be storage there along the left-hand side. Yeah. And they may, right now that is what is dedicated for additional storage. The nice thing about a lot of the product is that you're able to store it mm -hmm. where you're selling it in the selling space. And so, I, again, this, the picture we have is not very good quality. I can't read almost any of the letters on it. Um, so the inside space is, is mostly shelves or is mostly... Some other kind of stand So there displays? are several displays, yes. So if yeah. you're looking at those blocks in the center, yeah. those are actually um, display cases. Do you want to talk a little bit about what sure. those look like? Yeah, they're, they're, uh, they would be similar to if you went into a, a club store and you would see shelving lined up, because mm -hmm. it would be a lot more attractive than that. And then above it, you would have your storage of the very same items that are below. I got it. In okay. case one. Basement available to us, so we right. need to have some storage above. Right. Okay, good. 
And then, um, since I'm on the floor pen, one question I had was, so uh, I look at the picture walking in, it says entry, that's some of the letters that are legible. And then you kind of go down, and I guess on the left-hand side is the entry into the new pharmacy. And then, if I go up on the right-hand side, it looks like that wall's been cut out. Do you know what that represents? Is, there, is that just a bad copy, or is there some proposal to take out a chunk of that wall for some purpose? I'm sorry. I'm not seeing. May I approach you? Yeah, 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 please. Do you see where I, see where I am on this, on this map? I circled it. So this is the, f right, okay, oh God, I, I, um, something I can actually read. Is this better? Yeah, you much have better. this copy. So what is that? Is that a window or something that goes in? Is that a proposed change in the, in the, in the outside no, of the structure? there's no proposed change on the outside at this point. Because so that looks like not a wall anymore, right? To me that looks like a window well, or something. Uh, perhaps that's, um, no, it's not intended to be okay. a window. Okay, so that's not a proposal to change anything, no. that's just something. No. Okay, fine. No. And again, that's more of the footprint, of course, we're only renting the space yeah. that we've given you, so to the extent that any structural changes are required, they would well, go right. through the approval Well, process. totally right, and that's why I'm asking, because yes. that, that, would not, that would not be acceptable, right? And so this is actually not part of our. Yeah. So, okay, so, so our footprint is from this door in okay, so for that's, licensing right. approval. So this is not part of your application correct. in a formal sense. That's correct. Oh yes, yeah, I can't say that stuff here. I, no, I can actually say. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I can. I'll pass around the board we'll if you don't want. Still work. Honestly. You want to look at? Yeah. Yeah, the frontage. Yeah, but I'm sure that. Okay. Okay, so that's good uh, on that question. And then my last question. Oh, going through your application, ownership. Uh, do you have a silent partner, someone involved? You have an interesting capital structure, which has got 109,000 sh shares of voting stock and then 10,000 shares of non-voting. I was just trying to understand, is, is there someone else involved in the business, or, or is that? No. No. There's, there's no reason other than the fact that corporate attorneys sometimes like to set it up that way, and I have no good explanation for it. Okay. But multiple, um, several of our clients yeah. have the, it structured that way, really so that in the event of any future shareholders, should they come in, okay. of course, we'd have to go through this whole process. But um, from the corporate organizational standpoint, some people believe that makes it easier. I don't. But again, but as that right. but, but is it in the document says you own 100 percent and, and so there is no there, there is, is currently no non-voting no not no one owns any shares or has any promises to own any shares or anything correct. else except for um, except for you okay right. correct. Mr. Chair, can we just follow on that particular Please. point? And it was raised earlier by somebody, I think Mr. Sistari. So you're going to be the manager of record for this location. Are you the manager of record for the other two licenses that you hold? Uh, I, I believe I am. I believe I am. And what, what, what happened is we, I started, I started off the process, trained the manager for the location, and then I had, then I could back off, and then I could come in and visit, basically, and not be there. Uh, yeah, you don't have to, as the owner, be the manager of record. You can, you don't even have to start off as the manager of record, but whoever is the manager of record is the person that is, on the license and it is responsible as well sure. as the owner. My question is, can we have an owner manager of record who also is a manager of record in other locations? Is the well, ABCC the, the allowed? The answer to the question is yes, okay. you can. Um, can, I, can, I just, can I just, I just want to pause you there. Can I, I, I need to hear the town's answer to that. So do we agree with the council's assertion? I've seen that practice in other towns. Okay, commonly? Okay. Are you good with that answer? I'm good with that piece of the answer. That piece of the answer? Yeah. Okay. I'm but I can, I can I just to amplify that You don't need answer. to. No, no amplification okay. required. So do you have any other? Any other do you want to on this on? point, I've got a couple keep of follow-ons if keep I going. could. Yeah. I keep thought you were still doing some stuff. Okay. Um, okay. So, we're tr so you made a point earlier that we had an applicant come before us recently and we said we didn't think it was going to work. It didn't. <clears> we denied it. That was a new, if I remember correctly, that was a new applicant for a new license to be issued in the community that previously was not in circulation or being used. Is that correct? Is that? Yes. So that was adding to the, to the market or the inventory, if you will, of licenses in the market. This is a current license that's been operating that is now going to be transferred and sold. So we're not adding additional licenses into the marketplace, correct? Yes, correct. Okay. 
Uh, and the license that we are, they are transferring and selling um, from the previous uh, occupant of the space and so forth to the new organization, that license is in good standing today and can be sold because we had, there was some discussion as this thing was unfolding a couple months ago, what, how that license, where that license was in the process and how that was, was it free and clear? And, and then there was some confusion around that and then I think it, the dust settled and everything calmed down and now we're here tonight. I just want to make sure that we're clean on the old, the old license, if you will, becoming the new license and the transfer is good. It's like a free, is, it, is the deed on the license clear? Not that that's the actual term, but. So I do have a one wrinkle to that, but I can wait till you, I can do it now or I can wait till afterwards. You got, do you have other questions you want them to answer? That's it. Okay. Do you know, I'm gonna, I wanna make sure I read this right. Do you know that, do you, believe you have to file an application to alter the license premises along with all this? I believe that that is part of the, um, I, my personal belief because it depends on the investigator that you get. Right. We need to file an amendment to the description because our description is changing from what it previously was. And so that one page, um, there's a one pager in the ABCC application yeah. that was provided that changes that description on the license from the existing description to the proposed description. Right, because I think one thing that's come up here is that um, uh, we thought the prior owner was going to file this application to change the premises, mm -hmm. but it's not clear that it was ever actually filed, mm -hmm. which means it, it requires you to submit the form. That's correct. And I don't know if that has to hold up this, but I do think to be a valid application, Ms. Kamal, am I getting this right, that it has to be done? Well, go ahead. I do understand that uh, your current application has a description, but I think the appropriate form should come out now. And if I can just Please. agree 100%, um, two things. Uh, there was a uh, supplemental package submitted mm -hmm. addressing precisely that point. Okay. Um, I have a copy of it here. I think it was sent overnight, so it just may not have made it into the board's packet. I don't think it's in our packet. Um, so uh, we, we do have all of those forms, and I have copies of it that were submitted. I would respectfully submit that it does not change the legal notice as advertised, nor does it change the abutter notification so that we've complied with the technical requirements. And it's a matter of um, whether the board is comfortable taking that vote on the supplemental information that was provided. And what's in it? The supplemental information? Yeah, what's in the packet of supplemental so, information? Um, do you have one you can give us? To, I have, And I can do. you also describe for us what's in it? I do. Mr. Chairman, um, you know, this, this was the root of one of my questions as well. And I guess when I look at this, you know, if we're, if we're approving the application for the license for this space, um, it, it seems to me that we would still be able to go forward and approve the license for operation in that space. Obviously, I don't think Mr. Siegel is planning on opening the operation until it's in that space. Um, and, and then if there's another step where we need to approve the change of space for the current license, then uh, that would just be a second step. So well, I think the only hang-up is I'll also go to ABCC at once. Go ahead. You are going to say Correct. something. Do you want to read so that? So just so that we're clear on what this is, the ABCC has multiple forms. The description that is in the supplemental information that I've just given a copy to the chair on is the description that is in your package. All it is is that there is an additional ABCC form. It's a one-page form, literally called Petition of License Change. So the information in it is identical to what you have had in your package. It is that additional piece of paper that when it goes to the ABCC, they want to see. And again, it does depend on whoever the investigator is. Many investigators believe, and I don't disagree with the concept, that when there is a license transfer, by virtue of doing that, you are very commonly changing the description. Belt and suspenders, we like to submit this just 
So that but again, this is know. alteration of premises, not just a description, right? So it's actually, that's the form you need to file. It's one in the same. So if you it look is at the, same the description exact thing. of the alteration, correct. Yeah. So if okay. you look, we have checked off on that form, uh, yep. which is the second or third page in that package. We okay. have actually checked off alteration of premises. Okay. And then description of alteration, we say change of description to on one floor, main entrance and exits, coolers, um, storage areas, emergency um, exit, plus or minus 3,400 square feet. So okay. that is the same as what is in the package. Okay. Mr. Chairman, uh, um, so, so does approving this at a technical level um, prevent uh, Mr. Siegel from operating where the business is right now? And do you have any plan on operating it as it stands today and then doing the renovations? No, it's, so open. it's shut down, you're going to do the renovations. That is correct. When doors open and there's banners all over the place, it's in the new space. That okay. is correct. Great. Right. That right. is correct. Thank you. I mean, this we is sort of their office. problem, right? Because if they submit it and it's not, it's yeah. not acceptable to ABCC, it just gets bounced back. Right. So it's sort of... No, 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 I understand that too. We yeah. care. We care because we want to know what they're going to do to it. But I think yeah. in terms of the yeah. downside... But the risk is... Them, is yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So just for the sake of clarity and for the public record, the application for the transfer of license is to the new proposed location within the store where Mr. Siegel purports to exercise the license. Right. Not, we're going to go in and run where it currently is and then we'll be back mm -hmm. to change it. This is all part and parcel of the proposed new operation. So I'll accept that supplemental packet is not a material change. If you look at it, I, you can see yeah. it yourself and decide if it matters to you. But I, I, yeah. to my mind, And the only additional, matter. so there are several pages there. For continuity, there were certain other pages in the application we wanted to make consistent. Right. Okay. Do we have any other questions? Everyone should get a chance to look through that and come to their own conclusions. But do we have any other questions from the board for the applicant while we wait? Uh, <clears throat> through the chair, I'd like to go back to the signage for a second. Just looking at the store in, in Newton, are, are you attached to doing an awning like that? Or would you go before the design review board to... Whether well, there's any awnings like there are in Newton? So I'm looking at the, the store um, in Newton. I think that's an old The red and white. Could I approach? Sure. Please. Yeah, thank you. So I think all that goes to another. Kind of all that goes to another committee, right? That's long gone. Yeah. yeah. We, yeah. We, long gone. Three years ago. Yeah. No one. Okay. Any other questions? So, nope. Mr. Hur. Just a little bit more about the signage, um, and I, I, I asked it originally just to kind of get a feel for how it'll play out. And there are other committees in it's town that will be part of that process because you have to file. Open paperwork yeah. for signage in the community per the bylaws. Thank you, though. Um, less is more around here. Just throwing it out there. I'm sure you hear that everywhere else you go. Uh -huh. Less is more. Uh, so please keep that in mind. And the more or less it is, the more easily you'll go through. Okay? Yeah, yeah, I Can I have that packet if you're done with it? I'm sorry. Okay. So, you're, so we're good on that. Again, signage is really the DRB. And then just one final point. I think we're getting ready to wrap this up, my sense is anyway. Um, so we asked these questions about the license, previous license, all that stuff, to make sure it is all clean because we don't want to come back and have this, you know, continue on. Um, that is why we ask these questions. It's not because we're opposed or, you know, we're just trying to get it right. So please don't read into it. Sometimes people read into things when we're just doing the job to make sure it's clean. Okay. Okay. Good. Mr. Kamalo. If I may, through the chair, ask a related question. Um, how do you normally advertise to your customers uh, the specials that you offer, you know, uh, almost you, on a weekly time, basis? Yeah. Through email. We co we've collected uh, many names that want to be on our email um, list, and we email the information to them. That's basically how we do most of the advertising. Uh, we have an existing customer base emails, yeah. not <coughs> flyers or separate. No, no. People that come in the store, they sign up on a, on a card, uh, you know, on what their interests are. They drop it into a box. We add it into the computer, and then we send them out emails. Thank you. Board good? Any other questions from the board? Mm -hmm. Is this, is this uh, for ours or do you need this back? Um, it can be. I, I know that um, there's one, there's the original, but if okay. the board would like to keep that additional copy. All right, we'll hold on. Okay. Uh, any questions? Do we have any butters present? Do we have any members of the public who would like to speak uh, with regard to this or ask questions? Anyone, anyone out in the audience who would like to um, be heard? 
Okay. Seeing no takers. Um, uh, last chance for the board to ask questions before we close the hearing. Anybody got any questions? Okay, no questions noted. Chair will entertain a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. We have a motion. We have a second. Do we have any further discussion on that? All in favor of closing the public hearing, say aye. 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 Opposed? President not voting. That's unanimous. The public hearing is now closed. Now the board will deliberate. Um, so the matter at hand is now to, um, to take what we've already learned and, uh, and decide if we want to uh, transfer this liquor license. Um, Mr. Sestari, you got any comments to start off on that? No, I support this. I, you know, I, I think that it's, uh, um, Mr. Siegel seems to have a, a good history uh, in the business, and I think that it'll be uh, a welcome addition. Uh, or Martin. augmentation. To the yeah, he, he's been a very good neighbor in Newton for for many, very, uh, for many many years, and um, they've always supported him. And I, I believe that that uh, we could also. Okay, uh, Mr. Hart. Uh, a couple of things. One, I think we are transferring here, which was important to me to to highlight. We're not adding into the into the community additional uh, capacity, if you will. Uh, so let's keep that in mind, and I think the community would. Would do well to keep that in mind as well. Uh, I lived, I was a neighbor of Marty's Liquors in Newton for several years, uh, about four blocks back, and uh, it was right out of college, uh, and I was carded routinely, and uh, at the time it sort of annoyed me. Uh, here I am, 53, and I hope that the applicant cards everybody uh, that walks in the store and, and makes it a habit to make sure uh, everything is straight up. I'm sure he, I know he did then, or his team did then, and I'm, I'm very comfortable uh, that he will play by the rules, keep our community safe, and thrive as a business. Okay. Mr. Mosier. I just want to reiterate that the fact that it's an existing license at an existing location um, meant a lot to me, and then hearing the proponent's history also. Okay. I'm good. Good. Thank you all for coming in. It's nice to have somebody come in. You had your act together. I mean, the board appreciates you being uh, con concerned about our time and, and making this efficient. So um, I appreciate all you did and all you came with. And I think having good answers was was very helpful to the process. Mr. Kamal, do you have any any questions for th our comments um, for the board? I, from a legal standpoint, legal counsel signed off on all these documents. He's we're we're comfortable that everything's in order. Yes, that is correct. Okay. Good. Uh, Chair, I entertain a motion to uh, approve the, tra the proposed transferred liquor license uh, to Siegel and Sons Investments. So moved. Um, and forward to the ABCC. Second. Okay, we have a motion. We have a second. We have any further discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? President not voting. That's unanimous. So uh, we, okay. uh, we will forward the application to the ABCC. For, you know, May I also ask for a vote? Uh, this may be the same question. Um, I, I would recommend to the board that uh, you also move a separate motion approving the uh, alteration of the license premises. Uh, okay, the alteration of license of the premises. And I just, if we're gonna do that, I just wanna validate that what she told me is true, which is that it's only their piece inside. I'm a little worried about this thing that looks like a window in the wall, and I wanna make sure we're not, right? We, we couldn't approve that if we want to, right? So do we agree with that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. All right, so, uh, so the, the question is, will the board approve an alteration of premi license premises? Al alteration of license premises. Chair will entertain a motion to, um, to approve that, that application as well. So moved. Second. Okay, any further was discussion that, on that? Was that the question that council was going to ask us to look at? It was. Okay. It was, just so that on the form 43 that goes to the ABCC, all, all right. bases are covered okay. that way. Two boxes are checked off instead of one. So you raised the question about a window? Well, actually, I, I, when I look at the picture, it doesn't look to me in, like there isn't one. I just wanted to make sure that we weren't, by voting this in some fashion, sort of endorsing that, right? All we're endorsing is basically from their door. Right. If this, this, we don't, this, isn't, this isn't part of it. If there are any changes, we have from the site zone. If there are any changes, we would have to go to site plan review. I, I just want to make sure that no one, no one accuses us of, of endorsing something we can't endorse. So right, but, but in terms of us approving the alteration of premises. I would not approve the alteration of premises if it included a window from one tenant to another into this space. It doesn't. It's, it, it's, so, it's, it may not even be a window. It just looks to me like I don't know what it is and I just want to make sure we would sign off on it. It is not an interior window. And it is also not part of the premises right. being proposed to be licensed. There will be no window between or anything like that. That's why I was asking that separate entrance from the, from the other yeah. tenant, too. Correct. There are no windows contemplated between one tenant and our operation. They're wholly separate. That is. 
Well, oh, you don't want them watching uh, CVS? <laughs> All right, so we have a motion. We have a second to approve the application for alteration of premises. Mr. Just motion. point of order, Mr. Chairman. So is there, is there any issue, Mr. Kamal, this being a posted public hearing with this not having been part of the, the public packet? It is. It is. It is. Part it, of is. it just wasn't very legible for me. Okay. The only thing that wasn't part of the packet was the supplemental package, and that was de minimis, in my opinion. So I, I, I'm okay with that. But that referenced everything that was in here. That was that's in the pa public right. package. I think it's fine. And this 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 piece is legible. It's just on the iPad. On, on my it's not legible. Oh, with my eyes, maybe it's not legible. Okay. You good? Good. Yep. Okay. We have a motion. We have a second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. Present. Not voting. So the uh, the application for the transfer of license premises is approved. Alteration of license premises, Mr. Kamala. If I may respectfully, one more motion. Yes. <laughs> Approving the common virtualis license application. <laughs> Okay. Uh, motion is to approve the common victualless license application. So moved. Second. Any further discussion on this? Anybody so, any questions? So let's just get clarity on what this is so that we don't have any questions from exactly home. Right. We Kamal, did the license transfer. Application for, right? Application. We approved the application for the license transfer. Mm -hmm. We approved the uh, alteration, alteration of premises. Application for alteration of license application premises. Application for alteration of premises. Right. And now we're approving the common victor license, which is typical that we do annually for any establishment requiring a license, correct? At this particular license Mr. of Kamala? this type. Is that? Well, in, in, I don't know, if Mr. Kamala. Tom Manager. Yeah. Mm. With just one minor clarification, any establishment that operates a business in town. Right. Do you agree so with that? Yes. I was, I was okay. just going to state that because of the specialty items, the CV mm. would also be and required. Does, does the common victuallers license uh, permit sale of tobacco? No. no. So there will, be no, there will be no tobacco sold uh, in the store? There is tobacco sold in both of our stores as we speak. So does that require another vote at another time? Go ahead, Mr. Kamal. Through the chair, I believe that will require a separate application to the Board of Health. Okay. Thank you. This is just to sell food. Okay. okay. So the applicant knows not to go out and purchase any tobacco inventory until that process Without is handled. Without being properly approved. About what we want. I just can't sell yes. it. Right, I'm so, just trying to yeah. keep his inventory no. cost up. Exactly. Good one. <laughs> wow. Okay. It's a lawyer. You good? Yeah. Any other questions on uh, the board, the, the matter at hand, the motion being to approve a common visualist license? Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Present not voting. That's unanimous as well. Anything else? Nothing we're, in further further. we're in an approving mood tonight, so what else would you like? <laughs> okay. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for coming in. We enjoyed having you. Having you all. Well. Good luck. Thank Good luck with the store. Yeah. When do you think you'd be open? Uh, sometime after the first. Okay. Gonna miss. Oh, gonna miss New Year's, but okay. So. I know. <laughs> all right. You're trying to rub it in. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for coming in. Good luck with things. Thank you. Okay. We're now going to continue off the agenda. We have a continued posted public hearing for 110 Grill LS Hopkinton LLC. It's an action item. The proponent is 110 Grill LS Hopkinton LLC DBA 110 Grill. Location 77 West Main Street, Hopkinton, Mass. So I think that's a matter of some debate. We can actually do one Lumber Street instead. The board will consider, continue a public hearing to consider approval of an application for a Section 12 all alcohol license and petition for a change of license, a pledge of license in stock or stock, for 77 West Main Hopkinton LLC and forward to the ABCC for their affirmation, as well as consider approving a common victual license and entertainment license. There are a number of exhibits. Welcome, sir. Can you introduce yourself and Thank you. start this off? Mr. Chairman, for the record, Attorney Kevin Erickson on behalf of the applicant, 110 Grill LS Hopkinton LLC. Okay. Um, and I'll note this ad, this hearing has been previously open, so we're just continuing it, so I don't have to make, there's no motion required for this. Go ahead. Thank you. As uh, the chairman alluded to, um, I did find out today that the, uh, the building inspector has assigned this uh, property a one lumber street. Uh, address and I did see those in the uh, the comments yeah. uh, posted for this meeting as well. So uh, we do agree with that. Um, I'm, I don't know that that was the case, or I certainly didn't know that was the case when the application was filed. To give you a little bit of a background on who we are, the 110 Grill currently operates in Chelmsford and Nashua. We're opening a location in Berlin, uh, slated to be open in uh, February, and that will be at the Highland Commons. Uh, 
uh, right off of the uh, exit 26 on 495. We're also uh, in the process of, of, of getting approvals for a location in Acton, uh, Massachusetts, uh, and we plan to open that one sometime late uh, 2016. Uh, this location we hope to also open uh, early 2016 as well. So we're unrolling three more locations. We're in Chelmsford and Nashua currently. Uh, we're an upscale American grill. Um, I have uh, sample menus that I can pass out to sort of give you an idea of uh, the flavor. We have a, a very unique concept um, in the sense that uh, our food is high quality, um, reasonably priced, and uh, with an open kitchen concept on the inside. A uh, nice bar area. We do uh, host for uh, uh, business groups, uh, committee groups. Um, we do cater. Uh, and uh, we, we've had a lot of success with our model. We're very excited to be joining the Hopkinton community and looking forward to rolling out more of these restaurants as we go. If I could approach, I will hand out a couple of things while I keep talking about specifically our application. And I do want to give uh, Jamie my butter notifications, the postage, I mean the, uh, the newspaper notification and the certified boxes. Very well. Let's see. I don't have enough of these, but certainly. Thank you. Sure. I'm already hungry, so I don't want to look at that. <laughs> <laughs> and then I've got. Uh, menus here as well. So you this would go much faster if you bought appetizer samples. Yeah, I should have done that. <laughs> so the proposed restaurant uh, <laughs> is to be located in the new development on One Lumber Street, um, located in approximately 5,000 square feet. I think the lease uh, states 4885. Uh, we're proposing 140 interior seats with 40 seasonal uh, exterior patio seats. Um, we're asking for the license to serve uh, interior as well as on the patio like our other locations. Uh, we have secured financing and in fact we're, uh, we're closing this week on financing for this uh, restaurant as well as for uh, the restaurant in Berlin. Um, we're also seeking the common vitriol license uh, naturally and our entertainment license uh, which we have currently in Chelmsford and Nashua as well and uh, recently obtained in Berlin. Uh, we do have uh, some live music on occasion, generally limited to two times a week, uh, in, mostly in the summertime on occasion in the, in the wintertime. Uh, but we found that to be uh, very well received. I just have to say, why would you need entertainment when you have tater top poutine? No. <laughs> Uh -huh. We added that after the entertainment. <laughs> so typically uh, the type of entertainment that we have, other than the TVs uh, that a typical restaurant would have, uh, you know, for surrounding <coughs> events and things of that nature is uh, a single performer, uh, acoustic, typically. So I would like to uh, certainly open it up for any questions that you might have. Okay. Uh, that's it for the presentation. So over to Mr. Uh, Catino. You want to start off? Yeah. The the only things that that um, concern me was the seven days a week to one o'clock in the morning. Is that including Sundays too? So we've asked for that in the okay. in the entertainment <laughs> license, um, largely uh, because. We're going to feel out the market. I wouldn't expect that Sunday we would actually be open till, till 1 a.m. That wouldn't be our anticipation. Do we have, does, uh, Mr. Powell, do, do you know, do we, what are, what are the, the common closing times and such for, uh, for some of our other restaurants uh, with liquor licenses? I don't know anything's open at time past 10. Yeah, yeah. Remind something to be open past eight. No, that's it. Mr. Um, uh, Parr. Yeah, the, lease, the lease, has that been executed? Yes, sir. So the lease is in place. Okay. What's that? Okay. Mr. Sestari. You all have the tater top poutine <laughs> and the Reuben. Um, do, uh, 
Um, have any of the other locations uh, had any, any uh, I guess, difficulties, any fines or closures or suspension of licenses? To none, the none whatsoever. Proper okay. Our general policy is card anyone who looks under 150. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and so right now, this is to approve closing at, at 1 in the morning? It's the application. The application. I mean, my preference would be for the board to have a discussion around that. And, um, uh, you know, my personal feeling is that uh, there's, there's not a need for that. And I'd prefer to s start scaled back and then, um, I guess, see, see how things go. And, and uh, if there's a request, then consider going later. But I, I, okay. that's my I mean, every preference. night or? Just Sunday night. Well, why don't we say that for deliberation? I think Sorry. I think that that's going to I think that's going to be echoed. Oh, we're Sorry. in a public hearing. We're in public Sorry. hearing. Sorry. Mr. Kamal, you have an answer. In answer to Mr. Corino's question, um, we have identified three outlets in town or restaurants that close at midnight. Hmm. We have also identified two others that close at 1 a.m. Hmm. What are those? Yeah, uh, uh, Cornell's and Coors. Cause. Co. Yeah, co. Yeah, co. Yeah. co. Oh. Uh, down on uh, seven days. Yeah. Who approved that? Seriously. <laughs> Do you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Uh, Mr. Mosier. Uh, just a question on the on the live entertainment and also having an outdoor patio. Yes. Would the live entertainment ever occur on the outdoor patio? Uh, we do do that in um, uh, Nash our Nashua location where it allows. Um, in, in Chelmsford, our patio is a little bit smaller. We do not do the live entertainment outdoors, uh, though, though here we probably would propose on occasion to have a, uh, a live entertainment occur outdoors. But again, it would be an acoustic performer. It would be you know, a type of thing that we would be certain that we meet your, your noise bylaw. Okay, so I'd like to discuss that once we close the public hearing. Okay. Uh, that's it. That's my only question. Okay. Um, my questions are, let's see. So um, has everyone signed the loan agreement, the bar and the guarantors? Actually, I have copies of that here. Is that today, an unredacted I... copy, by the way? Because another question I had was, you seem to have redacted some of the names out of the, out of the loan agreement. I think it's the loan agreement. And I don't, and I don't, I don't think the board will accept a filing that's redacted. There's a North, the Northern Bank Agreement in my package has got a number of redactions. Did you do that? Or did we probably did. Okay, so that's been done by the town, not by you. So you submitted unredacted copies of everything? I believe that's yes. the case. Yep. Can yes. I see the loan agreement just to, just to confirm well, that? I, I made copies of the first page, which has the town redacted version. Yeah, what I mostly care about is the guarantors, I right? So I, I'm, not, I'm not willing to sign off without knowing who the guarantors are. Are they on? Do you have the unredacted copy there? I may. Okay. This is. These are copies of the. Okay. Of the so I, I think we, the the town needs to know who's who's the guarantors on this. Sure. Um, you mean for the, the, the right? So we need unredacted copies of everything. Why are we getting redacted copies? That's my point. Well. I was unclear why the town would need to know who the guarantors of a, a private loan agreement are. I don't necessarily have a problem telling the board that, but I'm not sure that it's germane to this hearing. If they have a criminal record. Well, all of that has to be, well, again, remember, the application includes Corey request forms and for everyone who's a part of the, uh, the license. In this case, there's a corporate guarantee and a personal guarantor. Uh, the corporate guarantee, I'll just tell you, it's <laughs> the 110 Grill Management LLC is the corporate guarantor, which is the 100% member of the 110 Grill LS, Hopkinton LLC, and the personal guarantor is Robert A. Walker. 
Who's now, is the, that, so when it says in Section 3, it says guarantors, and it says essentially twice, unlimited guarantee of all the obligations. I'll tell you why it matters, because it, I mean, it, go, it goes to where the license travels if, if somebody defaults on something. I mean, sure. I no, I, I understand. I care deeply about this, right? Whose hands does it end up in? I, I understand. So, no, I'm, I, I get it. I'm just explaining why. I mean, this isn't just for the fun of it. So the unlimited guarantee of all the obligations of 110 Grill LS Hopkinton LLC, let's say you have two, and then unlimited guarantee of all the obligations of 110 Grill LS Hopkinton there's that two. last part's redacted too, so I don't know if that's a different entity. No, there's two because there's two guarantors. The and that's the two people you just said? And that's right. Primary and then secondary? No, nope, so they're, it's not, go they're ahead, both sorry. unlimited guarantors, so they're so it's jointly not a, several. It's not an unaffiliated, what I really cared about was it's not an unaffiliated third party, no. it's not a silent partner, it's not, a, it's no. not anybody else we'd have to vet. That's, what, all. that's all I really cared uh, no, about. No, and I, I now appreciate your, your concern. Yeah. So the, the, the first guarantor, the one that I mentioned, the 110 Grill Management LLC, yeah. is the 100% member of the uh, 110 Grill LLC. Hopkinton LLC okay. and Robert A. Walker, who you've seen on the application, is the uh, manager of the LLC. Fine, and he's the second guarantor. Okay, that's fine. correct. So there's no unaffiliated parties involved. There are none. Okay, um, and I didn't vet the capital structure as closely, but he owns 100% of all the equity of everything. Robert A. Walker's the manager. The the, the membership interest is held by the 110, 110 LLC. Management LLC. Does that and does that and I think it had the the two individuals who I assume are husband and wife, I'm gathering. Robert and Michelle uh, own the interests of the management company in their trusts, and I've provided that information. Okay, and they're the only owners of all that. That's correct. Okay, fine. So there's no, there's no one else involved with them is the, really the first question not. I'm trying to get to here. Okay. Um, has that loan agreement been signed? Because the copy we had at least was not. The, the copy that I just gave you this is, is, signed? is signed? Yes. It's signed, okay. Mr. Chair, while you're looking. Please. Um, so, similar to the license we just went through uh, in the previous public hearing, tonight are we approving a, a common vehicular license, correct? Including a liquor license, right? Uh, it's an application, yeah. Right, including the liquor license application. And through the chair to the council, if I could please. So, and Robert Walker is going to be the manager of record for that liquor license. Is that no, what you're the manager me? of record for the liquor license is Ryan Dion, who's the manager, the general manager of One Ten Grill. And he's shown in the documents as such. That's correct. So we know Robert Walker in Hopkinton. Uh, he developed um, uh, the learning the the next generation next generation. Uh, learning Center down the street here. He's done several of those around the state. Uh, I've known Robert Walker for 30 years. Uh, there's no conflict of interest here, by the way. I just know him. Um, but we have experience with Robert Walker in Hopkinton doing business. It's nice to see Robert's in the restaurant business now, too. <laughs> sure. And uh, Mr. Mosher, and please. Have, have the other locations had any violations, serving violations, fines? None. Loss of license, suspension, or anything? No, sir. Is this purely a holding operation for Robert and Michelle, or are they active oh, no, they're participants and managers? Mr. Walker is a very active participant in this business. He wants to grow it, and that's his plan. <coughs> we have, uh, you know, we have, like I said, we have a plan to open three more in 2016, including this one and uh, hopefully two to three more in 2017. But we can expect him to be in and out of this restaurant on occasion. He will. He will. He's in Nashua quite a bit. He's in Chelmsford quite a bit, and uh, this is not a far ride for him. So yeah. he's very interested in how the, the business operates. Why isn't he here this evening? He had another commitment, unfortunately. He normally does come with me to all of the Council meetings. Of was ever clear of that. Well, that's the way. That's, I don't think we care, but you can certainly ask. This one I asked, and he, that's what he gave me. Okay. Was I didn't know if that was from the previous meeting. Yeah, this is the one he gave us. This one, you can, you can certainly ask a question, but I don't, I don't know that. But go ahead if you want. Uh, so through the chair, uh, Norman, do you know if this issue that was raised by town council was cleared up just on the type of application being filed? Give me one second, so yeah, we might want to figure out that one. Senate permitting team comments. Uh, there should be an affidavit. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> Mr. Chair, when was this hearing opened? Was this open when I was traveling, perhaps? It must have been. It was the one the la it was the yeah, last meeting I was chair of, so maybe a month ago now. They weren't actually available, so but it was weren't. posted. So what we did is we opened it and then we immediately continued it because they couldn't make it. So it had been posted. We didn't want to have to repost it again. Okay. So, so we're they, just starting really tonight. So they didn't yeah. come. We I opened it, continued it immediately, and then and then they were still getting right. Is that an accurate That's correct. We were unable to attend, so we had to continue. And there's no reason why we can't participate. We ask this all the time, but. We weren't. Uh, there was no. There was John no, and I to participate. There was nothing provided. I mean, there was no. Um, well, first of all, just, even if you just missed it, it wouldn't. You know, you can always decide if you've got enough information to do it and and sort of participate. Right. But there was no information presented previously tonight. We we all got the exact same information at the exact same time. When well, we work on that. Can you tell me what Ryan Development LLC is? How is that involved in this? Ryan Development LLC is uh, a development company that Robert Walker owns, operates, manages. Okay. Um, so the lease to the property goes through that enterprise? The lease to the property is to the 110 grill. Well, it's, uh, so here's why I'm asking you, because I got a little confused when I was reading this. So it actually it says on this application for retail alcoholic beverage license that the occupancy of premises is, is um, the name of the entity that's provided is Rhine Development LLC. Where is that? I apologize. Uh, it's okay. Um, it is, let me tell you exactly what it's in. What's this document called? This is your application. Yes, sir. To the Board of Selectmen dated August 4th, 2015. And in that, if you go to page, uh, ba, 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 what page is this? It looks like page 8, I'm guessing. Um, uh, there's, it starts at the top with uh, contact number 6, contact person concerning this application. And then if, if you go down to number eight, occupancy of premises, it actually gives a separate entity that's going to, that its claims holds the lease. So I'm just wondering if we got a... That must be a typographical error. We have a, um, another location where uh, Ryan Development is the lessee, and then there's another lease agreement out there. But that's not the case in this instance. This, this instance, the... Uh, Ryan Development does not have any involvement in this premises. Right. Okay. So, um, okay. Here's, here's my, uh, first of all, I've got to take one second because I have to open another public hearing and then we're going to come back to this one. Um, so, uh, at 8.30 we have a posted public hearing. It's a poll location action item. The board will consider a joint petition from Verizon New England Incorporated to place new polls. Number one is at Franklin Road. Relocate one jointly owned poll number T.9 slash E.9 Locate on the northwesterly side of sideline of Franklin Road in a northwesterly direction a distance of approximately 17 feet with said point being approximately 170 feet easterly from the center line of Phipps Street. Number two is Franklin Road. Place one jointly owned poll number T.9A slash E.9A on the northwesterly side of Franklin Road at a point approximately 280 feet northeasterly from the center line of Phipps Street. There are several exhibits. Chair will entertain a, a, um, a motion to open the public hearing. So moved. We have a motion. We have a second. All in favor, open the public hearing. Say aye. 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 Opposed. Present not voting. That's unanimous. The public hearing is open. Chair is going to uh, move to continue that for the moment while we go back to this topic at hand. Sir, let me just, um, let me tell you what I think is happening here. Uh, we have a loan agreement that I think is inappropriately reacted, redacted, and I think we need a clean version to submit to the ABCC. Okay. Uh, and we have an application that I think has some incorrect information on it, and I think we probably need to have it corrected because this Ryan um, entity is listed as occupying the premises, and you just uh, told me that they're not. And I think we have some questions regarding some uh, affidavit provided by the um, the applicant that the board is going to probably want to meet this gentleman in person, perhaps, and, and ask and just and and, and, um, and have the opportunity to talk to him. Um, is the vibe I'm getting. So what I'd like to do uh, is to um, is to suggest that we continue this hearing to the next. Board of Selectmen's meeting, at which I'd like to ask that Mr. Walker would, would be in presence, okay. and that also that we could have final versions of all these documents cleaned up and ready to go. Does anyone on the board object to that, that thought there's process? Two, there's two owners, partnerships. It's Robert and Michelle Walker, correct? You wanted, is that what you want uh, Of the 110 Grill LLC. Management yeah. LLC, but Robert Walker is the manager of the, the licensee. Okay, so that one is fine then. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I, again, I think given some affidavits in their application, I think I'm, the, the, the sense I'm getting from the board is people would probably like to meet Mr. Walker in person. So uh, can I suggest that we continue this until the, um, the, the following meeting? Jones. I don't know. Does anyone else have any other questions or I, I, comments? Mr. Chair, like I do to, have a comment have just so yeah. they could prepare for it for the next meeting. So around the entertainment and the operating hours and the potential for the entertainment to be outside, I'd just like to get some uh, some sense of what your expectations are for that. And, and I can give you some feedback from my own perspective that I would not want outdoor entertainment into 1 a.m. Mm -hmm. Right, and so I think the third issue is we probably need to revisit the opening hours. I think that I think there's a a question about um, the desirability of one a.m., particularly seven nights a week. Okay. Does anyone else have any questions I'd like to ask the, no. this gentleman before the next meeting? All right. So, the, uh, do I need a motion to make entertain a motion to continue it, or do I just can I just do that myself? Right, so we're going to continue this. I think we'd like to get this on the agenda for the next meeting. We're not trying to hold you up, but we no, just want to make sure the packet is, is, is complete and is accurate and is what we need to submit uh, along with all this, right? And then, um, and I think we'd like to have the opportunity to, to uh, introduce ourselves to Mr. So, Walker. So for my purposes, again, just to, for clarity, um, I'm, I'm to correct this Section 8, which is, I'm looking at it now, um, Do you agree that my, my yeah, Ryan development should not be what I think this is actually saying is that Ryan development is the landlord uh, of the property which is which is not the case it's uh, right. Paul Mastriani uh, and his his entity right. uh, so I will correct that okay. you're absolutely right um, expectation for outdoor entertainment we should be prepared to speak to um, mm -hmm. Opening hours again. We'll be prepared to speak to for sure, and um, you know, Mr. Walker will be here personally. And then you need an unredacted copy of that that loan agreement. Well, again, I think I think it has. You've answered my question. I just I just can't believe you can submit that to the state and they're going to accept the redacted version. That that's required as part of the package, right? So I, I, I mean, I have no I have no problem. Yeah, I just I, I, I will provide it. Right, I, as on a philosophical level. Does anyone else have any questions they'd like to have addressed in the next meeting? Okay. Thank you, sir, for so coming Mr. in. Mr. Chair, well, before we leave this topic, uh, yes. we're gonna, we've continued it, correct? We have continued. We are, okay. I, have, I have, yes, continued this here. So, so now just a point of order. As I sit here and think this through and seeing Robert's name and all this discussion tonight, uh, and I mentioned I've known him for 30 years, yep. I had forgotten about this, frankly, when I mentioned it five minutes ago, but in fact, probably three months ago, I reached out to Mr. Walker about a business matter. Nothing came of that. But I want to put that in the record uh, okay. as being something I'm going to think about and speak to town council about All before good. we reconvene this public hearing. Okay. All good. Okay. Sir, so thank Jamie, you for coming you in. Again, we'll get you back please. on the agenda as quick as we can. We just thank want you. to have you. Let me know when that is, Jamie. Um, November 3rd. Thank you. Okay. Do you have any other questions for us before we move on? I don't. Thank you, you very do. much. Thank you very much for coming in tonight. Okay, so next time on the agenda is uh, the, the posted public hearing regarding the uh, polls that we opened just a few minutes ago. Do I see no one from Verizon here? Mr. Kamala, do you have any, um, any comments to make? Good evening. Three, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is a poll relocation that's required for the town's development of the Legacy Farms Road North. Uh, it's essential to the completion of our construction, and we would ask that the, the Board of Selectmen respectfully consider approving this application. Okay. Uh, I'm in the Board of any questions, starting off with Mr. Mosier. Any questions on this poll? Polza? No, Mr. Chairman, it looks pretty straightforward. Okay. Mr. Catino. Um, if we still, I still think it's good with it. I'm good with it. Mr. Herr. All set. And Mr. Sestari. No questions. Uh, you are, in fact, good with it? Yes, sir. Okay. Are there any, is there anything, that, any significant issues the board should be aware of, anything the board should need to know, anything that should give the board pause about this? Um, is it going to disrupt anything in any fashion that we're going to face down the road as a result? No, sir. The, the, the lack of relocating this utility pole will cause problems out there. So. Okay. Enough said. Chair, I'll entertain, uh, unless there's any other questions, Chair, I'll entertain a motion to close the public hearing. 
So moved. Second. We have a motion. We have a second. All in favor, close in the public hearing. Say aye. 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 Opposed? Present not voting. That's unanimous. The public hearing is now closed. The board will deliberate. Uh, Mr. Hur, do you have any comments to make about no comments. this? No comments. Okay, Mr. Sestari. Nothing. Mr. Mosier. I'm good, Mr. Chair. Mr. Catino. I'm good. Chair, I'll entertain a motion to approve the, relo the petition from Verizon to relocate uh, two poles on Franklin Road as previously described in the agenda. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. We have any further discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? President not voting. That's unanimous. So um, that petition has been approved by the Board of Selectmen. Okay. Last time on the agenda we're going to go back to now is the special town meeting article positions. We previously had a standing motion to, um, to vote in favor uh, of, to support these articles. We voted on Article 1. Mr. Kamalo. If it's okay with the board. Please. We, um, the board could go back to platform master planning team. We do have an email now from the Hockington Scouts Association right. naming the representative. Okay, we will go back to that item. So again, I'm going to reopen item number uh, five on the agenda. Could you provide us the name of this illustrious resident? Yeah, and then email uh, time 738, date is 1020. The Hopkinton Scouts Leaders Association appointed George Bradbury, B R A D B U R Y, yep. uh, to represent uh, the association. Uh, Mr. Bradbury is a dedicated minister. Okay, so he's been around for a long time. He's done. He's been scouts for a long time. So the scout association has the right to propose an individual for us to appoint, and they propose Mr. Bradbury. Does anybody have any questions for the town manager about Mr. Bradbury? Does anybody want to meet Mr. Bradbury in person? Okay. So uh, challenge a motion to appoint George Bradbury as the scout association representative to the Pratt Farm Master Plan Advisory Group. So moved. Second. We have a motion to second. Any further discussion on this? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? President not voting. That's unanimous. Mr. Bradley Bradbury is now approved to the to the. Hey, they got a quorum. Okay, quick. <laughs> Vote Brian her chair quickly. Okay. Good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now we're back to the special time meeting article positions. We're going to pick it up here on article number two, the Oliver Lane retaining wall, the sponsors of town manager. Mr. Kamala, do you have anything to tell the board about this retaining wall? I believe uh, John Westerling. Mr. Mr. Westerling, I'm sure he's got three-dimensional images. Sure, Mr. Chairman, oh. the picture's worth a thousand. Video, percent. good. As long as not a rusty truck. No trucks. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, three, Mr. Chairman. There's 140 linear feet of retaining wall on Oliver Lane that must be replaced. Now, this is to ensure the delivery of emergency services, the protection of the town's infrastructure, the convenience of residents, protection of abutting properties, and the protection of abutting natural resources. There'll be a photo that comes up in one minute here. We have two options. One is for $320,000 for a segmental block wall with a three-week construction period, and the second is a $420,000 reinforced concrete wall with a five-week construction period. Uh, in this case, we are recommending the least expensive and the least intrusive option, which is the $320,000 for the segmental block wall. We did check with the town's insurer, Maya, uh, and they said that this is outside of our coverage. Uh, if I can approach the pictures here, this is coming down Oliver Lane from Wood Street. and It's difficult to see here, but there's a differential settlement and you can perhaps see in this picture the wall is bowed out. If you go down on the property abutting the wall, you'll see that the, the joint has been broken. And this extends for uh, 60 feet. I, need, I think so. 50 yeah. feet in advance of this, and there's 30 feet on the back side of it. Looking down at this joint, what you'll see is here is where the wall should be, but the joint and the wall have have displaced by about a foot, and this is the far end of that wall. It's, it's a similar joint, which is also broken. Okay. Uh, questions from the board, Mr. Catino. So, this is this is a safety concern. Absolutely. And um, and uh, how long has this been been broken? We've been monitoring this through you, Mr. Chairman. We've been monitoring this for about six months. Uh, what we found was that it was moving just by small amounts.
but I think that this this past spring when we had all of the the significant meltwater that it, it really let loose right. thank you I'm sorry uh, mr. Her. how old is the wall was it the early 80s this would be here installed by the developer at the time correct bond is all done all that's behind us Ninety, we, perhaps. Yeah. yeah. It's <laughs> it's thirty years old, max. And so it was installed by the developer at the time. Correct. Then the town accepted the road, and this wall is on town property. Correct. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mojo. Mr. Chair, uh, when did the town accept the wall? Do you know, Mr. Kamalo, or accept the road? I guess I should say, or the lane, Oliver Lane. I don't have the acceptance here. The record now shows it's a it's a public way. But is that something that we could have accepted recently, like in the last three years, say? No. No, no not during our time. Through the chair, Mr. Westerling, how how can we how can we monitor or minimize things like this from from becoming this expensive through the chair that's an excellent question and something that we're we're looking at very closely it's essential that when infrastructure is being constructed will be that will be accepted by the town that it's inspected from beginning to the end what we're found here is that the vertical portion has actually snapped off of the horizontal portion at the bottom so it's not as though the entire thing has tipped but it snapped off which tells me that either they used the wrong rebar the wrong diameter rebar wrong length of rebar or something in that construction joint to make it fail this significantly so it's it's essential that during construction that we have someone there that's that's looking at construction of retaining walls construction of the infrastructure water sewer drainage we, we absolutely need that so through the chair obviously it has to be fixed um, I just I would I would just like to know when this was accepted make sure it wasn't in the time since I was on the board and if it was that we go back and look at the process we use for accepting uh, private as in, as public ways and uh, make sure we come up with a process to not inherit this sort of thing I think this is one of the larger retaining walls we've got in town alongside a street but I don't think this was accepted in the last 15 years I think it was before that mm -hmm. did you ever hit the wall <laughs> 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 were you insured so <laughs> I'm good. I guess my point was, I just want to make, I, I know you're very thorough, John, but I just want to make sure that, you know, as we go along in the future, I think we're pretty much done with accepting these things. But. I, uh, this is Ms. Kamal, Ms. Kamal, yeah. in, in, in fact, if I may, um, to underscore the point made by Mr. Moja, I've been with the town, I believe, seven years now. In my tenure, during my tenure, I have witnessed at least three or four subdivision ways give way to weather conditions uh, and to John's point I think it's important that we really take a close look at the ex the inspection regime that we have in place on some of these subdivisions. Whose responsibility is this? My understanding is that this was actually a comprehensive permit approved by the Zoning Board of Appeals mm -hmm. uh, and the road was accepted by the town. But who oversees the, the this is the, I'm sorry, Brian, I know right. the, this is the great risk, right? This is the, you do a lousy job doing this, this is, this is the best way to save money on stuff you're going to give to the town and get out yeah. of here before it collapses. So this is obviously a huge risk. Who oversees, at the end of the day, who accepted the road? Who, who, who makes, who, who looked at this to make sure it was accept, acceptance worthy? Do we know? We don't know. I don't know what the process was back then. Who owns this? Because it's not us. Mr. Hart, over to you. So the, um, assuming we move forward and 
fix the wall, what we get afterwards and what the residents in that area of town get afterwards is similar aesthetic in aesthetics to what they have today, except it's not falling apart. Is it going to look similar? Are we going to have concerns about we're changing the look of the neighborhood by what we're doing? Uh, through the chairman, the, the more expensive $420,000 reinforced concrete wall would construct something similar to what's there. What we're looking at, the, 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 least, the lesser expense of the $320,000 is a segmental block wall. So it's going to be uh, your typical, what, you, what a homeowner might even be able to do, but certainly better engineered and it will have uh, reinforcing fabric tied back into the soil. It's just stacking blocks that will, uh, will be married into the remaining retaining wall. The only, the, only people, the only people that will be affected by the change in the design are those folks that live just to the left. There's a single family home there, uh, and they would see that out of their, their side windows and along the side of their property. Have we checked with them about the situation and asked for their input about the aesthetics? Through you, Mr. Chairman, we have not on the aesthetic side, but they have been very cooperative with us through this process. I would encourage us to reach out to the neighbors and let them know what's going on and tell them there's a $100,000 difference. And I mean, those stacked walls can look very nice when they're done properly. I'm assuming we're going to do it properly. I would expect we're going to do it properly. But just to, to avoid us going down a path and then the whole neighborhood goes up, gets up in arms because they don't like what they're going to look looking at. pass that and do another look. It's fine, man. Well, I don't know if that would be the answer, but <laughs> I just think it's important that we get input so that we're not down the path too far and everybody gets upset. Can we reach out to Mr. Westland and make sure that they're... Absolutely, Mr. Chairman. Absolutely. I think there's a couple examples of that in town right now that we're trying to sort through, so... We're good. Uh, Mr. Sister. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so, uh, you know, I hear people talking about uh, when we accepted the road, but accepting the road, is that, is accepting the wall part of that? And I guess I'd like to make sure that that land is actually the town's, that the wall is, is holding back. Uh, so I know that there are some neighborhoods that have neighborhood associations and maybe a common, you know, a common area in the middle and, you know, that association pays for maintenance of that. I just want to make sure that this isn't one of those situations uh, where that, certainly safety concern is a safety concern and, and it needs to be addressed in some way. But I want to make sure that we're not just jumping in and replacing a wall that the town isn't actually responsible for. Do we have an answer to that question? About do we own that? Do we own wall? So that, that frontage, that frontage, the land that is that frontage, does the town own it? In fact, to add to the question, uh, John, could you point out the location of uh, other town utilities? Are they located before the wall or after the wall? Uh, through the chair, within the roadway itself, and the wall had to be constructed to construct Oliver Lane because it was a, a natural low point and a river used to run through it. Um, so there's a, there's a large culvert, uh, and, the, and the wall was constructed to support the roadway and the infrastructure. Within Oliver Lane itself, there are drainage utilities, there's a water main, and then just off to looking at this first picture to the left-hand side, uh, there's a sewer easement that has the, the sewer main. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so everything in town flows through Oliver Lane. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, a substantial amount of sewer from the from town flows, uh, not directly through this portion that's retained by the wall, but just to the left of it, that the easement cuts off through that private property. That I guess I'd, I'd still like to, you know, see whatever's on the assessor's map to see if the town actually owns that property that's being held back. Absolutely. Uh, because if we don't, it seems to me that it's someone else's uh, moral and fiduciary responsibility. Let me check that. I'm all set. Uh, okay. Um, so this wall is a severe risk of falling down over the winter. I mean, is there a reason? This is why we need to do this special town meeting on annual. That's correct, Mr. Chairman. And if it if it does fail, yeah, we lose we lose the water, we lose access to that roadway. That's a dead end street. 
There is an emergency access off of Baker, which goes up to Meserve, but that's, that's just one car width wide. Uh, we lose the drainage infrastructure. We cause damage to the abutting property, and our $420,000 project becomes a, a million-dollar project. $320,000 project. Well, depending upon which way we go. Um, <clears throat> okay. So, come, so it, is the wall in the bigger city hall? I want to go back to Mrs. Sestari's point. Like, you know, I don't know who owns the dirt back, but is the wall, is the wall in the right of way? Is the wall on the wall? We will uh, we'll verify, Mr. Chairman, that it is within the right of way and that no one else owns that. But, but yes, it is within the right of way for Oliver Lane. Okay, so we have at hand a um, uh, the Oliver Lane chain wall article. Um, I think the question is, do we want to figure out that answer before we vote this? I mean, I'm, whatever the board wants to do, if anyone wants to, we have a standing motion to, to support. Yeah, I, I can't support it until I know the answer to that question. Okay. Does everybody else think that's a sufficient uh, cause for concern? I think it's a legal question. We can't go in there and work if we don't own the land. Okay. All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold off on this one. We'll, um, we'll have another meeting before a time meeting. Does anyone else want anything else, Mr. Westerland, about this law? Uh, through the chair, John, you said that um, insurance wouldn't cover it. Right. Does it give reasonable explanation? The council review it and see any potential grounds for us to recover from the insurance <coughs> company. Uh, through the chair, Maya was was very firm with the fact that uh, something like this, even if it were a covered item, that it wouldn't this type of uh, degradation or. This, this type of failure would not be covered, and, and this lies outside of our, our list of covered um, assets. Okay. Thank you. I'm good. Okay. All right. So good. So we'll hold off on this one until we get the answer on who actually owns the wall <coughs> definitively, uh, and then we'll vote this before a town meeting, special town meeting. All right. Article 3 on the agenda is unpaid bills in the previous fiscal year. This is actually bills related to the Water Enterprise Fund. It's for $80,000 to pay a, a list... Um, of, uh, of expenses. Um, uh, my only question here is that that list of expenses doesn't actually uh, add $80,000. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, me. please, Mr. Kamala. Yeah. Um, we're actually in the post situation. We construct this article. The, for the board's information, I just wanted uh, to list the, the items covered. Okay. Uh, right, uh, right, right, made event. That's from the school department. Yep. The water enterprise operating budget. This is an issue that I'm reviewing first thing tomorrow morning with the town's consultant. Okay. Uh, we believe this may actually go away, except that the uh, FY15 um, audited uh, balance sheet shows uh, a negative uh, retained earnings balance in the, uh, for, the, for the water enterprise at the, in the amount of... Uh, Approximately $24,000. I got one. So I'm going to address that issue. Okay. All right. So this one's not ready for prime time either, so we're going to hold off on this, it sounds like. Am yes. I mistaken? Okay. So we'll come back to Article 3 um, also before a special time meeting. Yep. Article 4 is a fiscal year 2016 supplemental appropriation. This is a, um, a transfer from free cash. Uh, Mr. Kamal, do you, do you want to talk to the status of this article as well? Yes. Um, uh, the first item is 167,360. Uh, this is for uh, general government reimbursing the water enterprise for the hydrant rental. Uh, the second piece uh, is the uh, snow and ice deficit in the amount of 854,565 cents. Uh, and then the next is the historical commission's project. Uh, as you know, I think we went to town annual town meeting. Um, uh, and discussed, was this, Jamie, refresh my memory, this year or the prior year, uh, where we uh, 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 addressed this issue. However, uh, we, we, we also um, looked into the potential for a grant. That grant comes with an obligation for the town to pay at least 10000 okay. towards the work. Um, and then annual town meeting 2015, article... Uh, regarding the Hayden Raw Street property um, that the town purchased for the school project, yeah, we'll 1.8 million. 
and then for Mr. Westling uh, and DPW, Fruit Street Calvets, uh, there are two of them that have collapsed uh, and they will cost 119000 And then the fire department, a couple of requests. One is the PPE replacement. Uh, this is the turnout gear for fire firemen. We have an annual uh, commitment to at least uh, do five of these uh, in the amount of 13,421. And then finally, we also in the past years have provided uh, uh, peak season uh, weekend coverage uh, in the fire department at uh, approximately 7.9 thousand. Okay. So the backstory here is we ha didn't have free cash certified at the annual town meeting. And so this is presuming that there'll be a free cash certification to come. Ms. Kamal, can you talk to the status of the free cash certification? Do we expect it to come in advance of special town meeting? Um, we believe that um, the certification will occur okay prior to town meeting. Right. In fact, our local representative is scheduled to um, uh, be here at the town hall tomorrow morning at 8.30. Uh, we will have our whole team ready. Uh, there were questions that were posed to the town. We believe we've answered all the questions raised. All right. Okay. So this, this adds up in my head to sort of $3 million ballpark. And so um, is, uh, is our anticipation that free cash will exceed $3 million? Sorry. I always give the answer that we expect the amount of free cash to be greater than one dollar. Right. Okay. Yeah. So the non-answer answer. Okay. Well, the reason I'm asking Ms. Kamal is not to trap you, but because this is only an interesting conversation if the amount of free cash we have exceeds, exceeds what this is. And so um, uh, there's two questions. Will it be certain? Is it, do we believe this could, let me say it a different way. Do we believe this amount would realistically fall within the free cash that we expect to be certified? Uh, I believe so. Okay. Um, and then the next unless, question. Unless something comes up tomorrow morning. Okay. And then the next question, of course, is will it be certified in advance, which suggests this article may need to wait a vote until we actually know what the number is anyway. And then the other, right? Yep. Okay. So, so let's just talk through all these items, um, uh, if we can. So the hydrant rental is just a transfer that we always have, we always pay. We just didn't appropriate for it this year. Yes, and we've fallen behind. Yeah, I'm sure of that. Then the snow and ice deficit again. Is that isn't that is that not outstanding bills from a previous fiscal year? No. In, interesting enough, the as you know, the, the law allows us to money deficit. deficit spend. Yeah. So the bills have been paid. The bills have been paid, but we're in deficit for that. So that's money we've already sent the checks out for. We have to we have to pay that. Okay. Historical commission. I'll let the board discuss that. Article 135. I just want to highlight this one for the board's consideration. So there there have. Um, Here's the issue with free cash. We're going, to, we are going uh, ideally to have two years worth of free cash certified, both 2014 and 2015. If free cash is in the amount it has typically been in years past, that's, we'll, we'll, the number would be several million dollars, right? And so, so one interesting question for the town is, um, uh, what do you do with the free cash? If it's not appropriate, it goes back in the general fund, it gets recycled into the, into the um, uh, you know, available for use in the following fiscal year. So we don't actually have to appropriate this. You could actually just let it sit there and it would basically be money that would sitting around that would offset your budget in the future year. In years past, recent years, the, the, the amount hasn't been so significant to, to offset. Well, we have two things. Philosophically, we decided we didn't want to use free cash to fund the operating budgets years ago um, because that becomes a non-sustainable pathway. So we've been re very reluctant to use it for operating budgets. What we have had enough to do has been be able to pay it for a bunch of things in cash because, um, uh, uh, again, it makes sort of sense to, to sort of use it in that way um, uh, as opposed to just letting it, letting it sit and sort of go into the operating budget where, again, the risk is it becomes an unsustainable use. So one concept, and the reason this is in this, in this motion for discussion, is one concept is the amount this year will be substantial because it's two years worth of free cash, so what do we do with it? One way to to put the money to a capital use um, that would reduce the town's debt burden, um, support the school article, and um, uh, and be I think uh, philosophically in line with what we've done historically is to uh, 
use this money to pay for the property that we're buying for the school's purposes, which is the, the and I always get this one wrong, this is the Irvine property up on Fruit Street that the town voted the approval of. It's $1.8 million, um, and again, in lieu of bonding it, we could just pay cash for it, um, keep it out of the debt schedule, put free cash to arguably a good use. So that's why I want to explain that one. The other ones, I'll just let the board members ask questions. So with that background and information, let me go over to, um, to Mr. Herr to start. Questions on this? So number one, uh, the 167, I understand I'm fine. The snow and deficit, uh, ice deficit, that is an extraordinarily high number, but it is what it is. I don't think anyone's going to argue with what went on last year. Uh, I'm sure we've done a good job accounting for all that funding, and it is what it is. The Historical Commission, I'm fine. I want to come back to the million eight. Uh, the 119 on Fruit Street culverts, I see the pictures on the board here. I'm fine. Fire Department PPE and peak season impact, I'm fine. On the million eight, that was a debt excluded item that went before town meeting and within, quote, the four corners of that article, end quote, the funding source was going to be a borrowing. And then we went to the ballot. I like the idea, but I'm just trying to make sure we get this right and then in advance of town meeting. And then we went to the ballot and the citizens voted to debt exclude that item. In effect, by moving it into this article, it really is coming out of the operating funds now. It's just coming out of free cash, but free cash is still part of that overall operating budget tool. Mm. So, and yeah, I guess we could bob back and forth on that. But while I like the idea, I want to make sure that we have answers in front of town meeting in two, next week that we can do this. I'm just not convinced we can. I assume that town council has looked at this and he's okay with this? Yeah, uh, t town council has looked into the, um, the proposal. Uh, and remember, also for the record, the town has used free cash to pay for capital projects. Well, we have used free cash to pay for capital projects, but that's what the article said we were going to mm -hmm. do when we voted at a town meeting. Yeah. The free cash was going to buy that capital project. Mm -hmm. This particular asset the article said we're going to go get some cash from the bank and we're going to keep it outside mm -hmm. the two and a half and everything else. Absolutely. For, I mean, absolutely. Um, uh, the article did propose to fund it with debt. Uh, obviously, we didn't have the money, right? So there wasn't even a conversation to be had at the time. Right. I agree with everything you say. I, we're not, it's not, Ill, it's not by any means illegal or going against the article as either voted a town meeting or the ballot. It is in no way contravening any of that to propose to do this. And if folks want to do it, we just don't bond. So, so, um, and it's really, and again, we've not used free cash to fund operating budgets. Um, uh, well, we move it to stabilization, then we pull it out of stabilization. So I think you could tie it to just sort of our... Typical yeah, well, we've used a bunch of things, right? Free right. cash has gone to stabilization, it's gone to OPEP, it's gone to Middlesex retirement, it's gone to it's gone to sort of all the all the trucks and stuff we bought, a lot of that we just right. bought, right? right? So it's gone to a lot of that stuff. Um, this is in in keeping with that as a concept. I so like the idea. It's just a concept. Well, again, but it's I want to make a, sure we can concept. get it to work. It's a concept. It's, I think I'm sure it's legally valid. It, it, the question is, is this something we want to propose to do? Because if you don't do it. Well, we have two issues. If you don't do not that this, neither one is any bad issues, but the ramifications are if you don't spend it, it rolls back into free cash, which then would become actually part of, right on hand for next year. So it would effectively go into reducing the operating budget because it would be sort of on out. We unaccounted. could take that free cash and move it into stabilization so we can't touch it. But then you can pull it out of stabilization in the future, like we've done in years past. When That's we got certainly paid. another alternative is to put some of that into stabilization. I, I, I personally would rather reduce our debt. Okay. So, so, so two key points. One, we got to have the number <laughs> for free cash at the beginning of this meeting and be ready to put it out there. And if we don't, then this article has to get scrapped right up front. Or we're going to oh, have right. a repeat of what happened at town meeting in May. These all go away if we don't have the free cash. Okay. We've got to be very explicit about that, I think, right up front as mm -hmm. we sort of tell the, the members that gather, this is what we're going to talk about for the next couple of hours. Uh, number two... I support reducing our debt with this million eight in here, but town council has got to be ready to answer that question because I can see the people that are going to Mike to ask it right now. Mm -hmm. Okay? Other than that, I'm good. Mrs. Um I'm going to start out with 
the, the small number, I guess. Um, the fire department peak season impact. Uh, Mr. Kamala, could you explain that to me? Yeah, um, I think over the years, we've tracked the use of uh, overtime in the fire department uh, relative to peak times. Um, we've also, uh, as part of that review, identified the months of April, May, June as the peak times. And during those times, we've identified the need to um, at least have additional coverage for the weekends. What uh, makes them peak times? Uh, it's, it's simply uh, the review of the, of the data, the call data. Uh, no, I know, but what, what creates the need? The incidents, the calls, that, the calls that come in. The and calls. also, yeah, the calls that come in relative to the availability of staff to so it's not, it's not that vacation time is stacked in there, which causes more people to have to come in and make overtime because other people are getting vacation time and all of that? that. That does contribute. That contributes. Are we having that same problem in other departments? We have had a similar challenge uh, in DPW, but we did address that uh, contractually. Okay. So, and... and this is something that seemingly happens repeatedly year after year? Yes, though my, my, my hope is uh, with the incoming of two additional staff in January that we may see a different pattern. Yeah, it seems to me that this is something that, uh, you know, I know we've had discussions around before, but, you know, this, this we need to uh, manage our way through this so that it doesn't happen. Um, you know, I mean, vacation time, vacation time shouldn't be causing us to go outside of our budget and, uh, and that type of thing. You know, I'm, I'm saying it in general. I'm not looking at you like, you know, you manage this. <laughs> but, um, okay. Uh, regarding the um, Hayden Row uh, property, uh, the $1.8 million, uh, my personal preference is that that number be taken out of this and that um, that portion of the free cash be used to, um, I guess, lower lower the the remaining you know base of our of our tax base. Um, my personal rationale is that uh, that that 1.8 million dollars is part of that school. The school is going to be getting paid for and used over a longer span of time. And in effect, it's the, the people who are around who are getting the benefit of that school at that time who are paying for that, for that portion of the debt. Um, as opposed to uh, the people, at, which is all the town's residents who have paid in to this free cash and allowing everybody who has paid in or the majority of people who have paid in and haven't moved out of town or whatever to benefit from this kind of lowering that, that general tax base. Um, so that's, that's my opinion. And it may be just moving coins from one pocket into the other. Um, but I guess when you look at, when you look at um, the $1.8 million over a 20-year period, uh, how many households do we have in town? Five or 6,000, something like that. You're looking at $300 over, you know, not including interest, but over, say, a 20-year span that each household is going to save. So that's $15 a year, um, you know, as opposed to uh, saving $300 in, in the people's pockets immediately who have paid that into, uh, into the taxes over the last year, two years, and it's free cash and they'll benefit from it immediately. Mr. Mosier. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Quick question, have we done an analysis to see, right now our lending is fairly inexpensive, what the impact of a larger contribution to OPEB would be, how that would factor out? Can we do that when we get that article? Yep. If that's okay? Yep. Okay. Do you have anything on this one, Article 4? No. 
Okay. No, I was just talking around the free cash. Yeah. Well, so, it's all. In, in fact, it's what's interesting is all this. I mean, here's the issue, and I, and I, you know, what I really want to do is talk about these tonight because we're not going to be able to vote any of these tonight. I don't think articles four, five, six, and seven. I think are all paid out of free cash, right, Mr. Kamalo? Yeah. So, so the, you know, if you add them all up, they're about four point seven, four point eight million dollars. So. Again, this is only an interesting conversation if mm -hmm. if we have four point eight million dollars to allocate, <laughs> yeah, yeah. right? So one of the reasons I don't want to bother to vote all this is it's not it's not clear what what the number is going to be and whether we can even cover all this. And then to Mrs. Sistari's point, there is it is a valid conversation topic about what do you use to pay for this stuff versus what do you use to pay for longer thinking things versus what do you what do you do is basically kind of a one off bonus, right? I mean, it would be a one off bonus to people, but and it would come in next year's budget. But it is a valid conversation. So I mean, I, th I think um, so. What I really want to do is just let us all ta ask questions and talk about all these tonight and ponder all this, with the expectation that we'll have to go in before the meeting once we know the free cash is being certified and actually at that point make those decisions. So this is sort of a of a, a, a stage setting conversation I think tonight, right? Because we're we're just not going to be able to vote any of these four. I mean, is that is that a fair comment, Mr. Kamala? Well, except for the voting these things. I mean, right? Okay. I think that's a fair comment. Okay. Ms. Katina, got any comments on this? Yeah, that, well, that being said, I concur with uh, Mr. Sestari about the uh, about that 1-8, only because we, 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 the way it was voted, and I don't want people thinking it's a, we're, we're just quickly switching and deciding where we want to where we want to put this, the uh, the 1.8. Because so many people come up to us and say, look, you know, we we brought in uh, another uh, million five or $2 million every single year. So when are the taxes actually going to go down? Why do you spend right to that limit each time. And that, um, you know, once in a while, like Mr. Sari said, if we can save somebody 300 bucks, we should really think about it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So, um, so Chair's not going to entertain a motion to, to approve Article 4. Does anybody else have any questions about any of these other, um, any of these other items though, that we need to talk our way through? Clearly the 1.8 will be a discussion topic. So Absolutely. is there anything else we need to talk our way through? Described it perfectly. <laughs> going, going. Uh, through the chair. Loader mounted snowblower. Where are you? I'm sorry, John. I want, I'm in Article 4. Yeah, okay. I'm in. good on Article 4. Okay. No, and then Article 4 is what I meant. Yeah, All right. So general yeah. stabilization, Article 5. This is the transfer of $300,000 from free cash to the stabilization fund. Does anybody have any questions about that? I'll just open it up. Why did you pick that number, Mr. Kamala? Um, I think back when we, we were working on the budget, we felt that was the number that uh, okay. could be supported through free cash. Okay. This will be my turn to be provocative. I don't know that I see the continuing benefit of and continuing to put money into general fund free cash. Um, we have a lot in there already. How much is in there now? Uh, Four million bucks? What, what's the number? Do you know? No, I think we're less than that. Less than that? Yeah. Okay. We have a lot of cash, free cash. We have a lot in there now. It takes a two-thirds majority to get it out. And, and in my opinion, I mean, towns like us don't have these dramatic events that require you to pull the money out of free cash because it's all, we're all residential tax base, right? So when you're, the upside of being 85% residential tax base is you don't get a lot of fluctuation, right? Even if the EMC pulled up and left town tomorrow, which they, obviously they say they're not. You're talking do. about stabilization, not free <laughs> cash. You're, you're well, no, it's going into free, it's general going into stabilization. Right. So the free, free cash, cash money going goes into stabilization. And then it's called stabilization. Correct. Yeah. Okay. And so what I'm trying to say is the money, the need to take the money out, in my opinion, That's the time you know, a it's hard to get, b it's unlikely to really happen to us, and and I and I feel like we've we've made a habit. I mean, I w and I was on board when we first started doing this. So going back, whatever it was, ten or twelve years ago, I was I was sort of early in this whole process, and I liked it then. But we've put a lot of money into free cat into stabilization now, and I I would like us to be thoughtful about why we're. And I raised this issue last year too. I'd like us to be thoughtful about why we're putting money into stabilization. What's the incremental? It all goes to the bond rating. I mean, that's one of the well, big. Well, but drivers. we're kind of there. We're already got a good bond rating. We're not. If we're, not we're at AAA. Plus, we're not, but I think we're, what are we? We're not. We're AAA. We could get to AAA plus. I don't think there is a AAA plus, to be perfectly honest. It's AAA. So we're at AAA. Yep. So whatever that, so that's to your point, we're at AAA. And by the way, the margin of increase for each of those things is not that big. And there's a benchmark that that number should be. And if we're at that benchmark, then I would agree with well, you. Well, we're below that benchmark, but we're not, but we still got a good rating. And 
and again, you know, in my opinion, the marginal benefit, I mean, so it's great to be able to say whatever, whatever, triple A credit. I mean, but just on a do, from a dollars and cents perspective, uh, you know, and all these bond rating agencies have, have different ratings, so I'm going to get it wrong. But, you know, triple A to double A plus to double A to double A minus is not like some remarkable interest it's rate. pennies on the change. interest rate. It, right. it, is, it is remarkably small amount of money. So, so uh, it's nice to be able to say that, but I, I think the pragmatics are, I think this has become, here, here's what I'm trying to say. In my opinion, and again, having started, having been very much in favor of this 12 years ago, whatever it was, and we started doing this in the first place, I think this has become a ritual without a rationale behind it. And I'd like us to really be thoughtful about having a rationale behind it. So, so I'm trying to monopolize the conversation, but Mr. Kamala has a data point for us, I think. If I may jump in, um, I think one of the reasons why it may make sense to continue to to consider the stabilization fund and investing it uh, mm -hmm. as a premium investment is for cases like the one we just discussed. That's what I was just going to say. Only yeah. Yeah. That's what that's what we should be using. The town could consider using it for. Well, except we're using free cash for it, right? I mean, if we didn't have the free cash for it, maybe we would do it, right? So maybe we. But I will. Well, I will tell you two things. A, getting money out of stabilization is is going to be very very difficult for anything less than a complete nuclear meltdown in the center of town, because it, there's always going to be a question of why this, right? Why this project and not and you know not why that project. And so I, I just I feel like we you, we've put a lot of money in here, and I don't know what it would ever come out for. I, I've never seen a, I, we, it's, We've never even talked about taking any money out of it. And so, um, uh, unless without more of a rationale for why we're doing this and what the actual purpose is, I I have started to have a lot of questions about why we keep funding stabilization. So you're making an argument for a crazy word that we dealt with a couple of years ago, I think to some extent. You're talking about an underwrite. Well, uh, no, 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 no. I'm just saying, don't put free cash. <laughs> so through the talked no, about <laughs> right. <laughs> Through the chair, do we have anything in our existing financial <laughs> policy that addresses that addresses this? Yeah, yes, we do. Um, it, it, the policy does set a, a target. Uh, we right. are below that target. Um, again, it's been said, uh, it's been argued before, it's important for the town's bond rating. The bond rating has, uh, in the long term, uh, an impact on how much we pay for bonded items. So I think... That's, that's the value. So, so through the chair, could, well, we don't have a lot of time, but I was going to say if we could take a look at that policy, and the, although we may be below it, we may have made a whole lot of progress towards it. And what does that curve look like? Maybe we, Again, maybe we can right. throttle back a little bit. Well, and maybe this isn't the right time to do it, right? Maybe I'm just starting the conversation, not finishing. But I do think, I do think, it, I do think this is the kind of thing that's become a ritual, and we should ask questions about. It. I'm monopolizing, yeah, Mr. Well, Coutinho. To, to Mr. Hur's point, you know, this this is the, again we, we talked about the money back. This is fifty dollars per household. Again, you know, goes back. You know, so once in a while we have to start thinking. Do, you know, just because the money, money's came in, you know, let's, that we don't have to spend it all and, and put it all away and, and to, to a point where, uh, to a spot, to, to, to your point, that um, it's impossible to pull it out of. If, we can't, if we're putting it in, in, into, a, into a vault that um, we won't be able to get it out of for a rainy day, then uh, we're just fooling ourselves and taking money from, taking money from, our, from the constituents and townspeople. We, and could, we could keep growing it. And then have a tax free year for the 400th. <laughs> yeah, the 400th. <laughs> no, I, 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 you know, understand what you're saying. I think it's something that is definitely worthy of discussion. Um, you know, I'm with you. You know, we've had, we've had this fund. You know, it's it's always been there, and uh, I can't ever remember a conversation where we, you know, considered taking anything out of it. You know, to use it. And um, and now it's at such it's at such a number, where maybe it's not at whatever the metric is eight percent or ten percent of our budget, certainly around five percent. And you think about the projects that we do around town, uh, how how many of them actually get to you know four million dollar mark or somewhere in that area? None of them are uh, none of them are really emergencies. 
And so for it to be called stabilization and then use it for something else, it, it's, uh, it's an odd thing. So I think to try to keep growing it, it probably doesn't make sense at this time. And, uh, you know, maybe we do have to evaluate as we're moving forward, uh, you know, things, things like, uh, you know, this, this wall that is being considered for replacement. Is that something that does fit the model for something we would use this for? And, you know, and then maybe it's, you know, free, the free cash that isn't used for that gets rolled into the next year and applies to the, the general tax base. Yeah. Well, again, if you're if you're worried about transfer payments, this is the ultimate transfer payment. It's going in, never coming out for years, right? <laughs> so, so that's the. Yeah. I will say though, just to, just to come back to this though, part of the anxiety I feel is is having seen us a long time ago using free cash to go into operating budgets, and that's why we got away from it because yeah. the problem yeah. is event, you have a you have a you do have a light year, you don't get all the new growth you expect, whatever something happens, and all of a sudden you've created a huge hole in your operating budget. So I will caution us to the extent we look to to have free cash roll into the budget. A, it's something we we tried very hard to get away from. Mm -hmm. B, if we think of it as a one-time bonus, I guess you can sort of get get there better. But I will tell you that you get no credit for it at the end of the day, and you and you don't necessarily do any benefit to yeah, the contract. Yeah, exactly. And, no, and, I, and I think that it's important that you mention that. I, you know, I think it's also important <clears throat> to note that uh, at least my knowledge of every member of this board has been, you know, very strict discipline in that area, uh, you know, for the past seven years at a minimum. Yeah. So, uh, no, I agree. Okay. We, right. we did use stabilization in the mid-2000s to balance the budget, I believe, two years in a row. Because no. we went from about three million down to about nine hundred thousand in stabilization for a couple of years there, because we were pretty tight. Yeah, that's when I was off. This is before the recession kicked in too, and some of the other things we did along the way. Yeah. Um, but there were some lean times where we did use stabilization at annual town meeting, plus free cash, plus you know tax base mm. to make it all work. So I think it has been. I, I've seen it used in the past. Okay. Um, but it's not easy. I just think it's a conversation to have. Okay, Article 6, uh, OPEB liability. Mr. Kamalo, the concept here is $411,118, again, for in free cash. Uh, that number is selected because it's the actuarially determined contrib required contribution? Yes, that is correct. Okay. So this is one where, again, the pressure we're going to get from this is we've had people stand up before and say, why are you putting so much in? You know, you don't have a rationale for it. Well, the hole continues to get bigger. <laughs> And and um, and so what we've done now is said that um, every every two years, right, Mr. Kamal, we get a we get an actuarial evaluation of the plan, and we have and what that basically tells you is how much money you have to put in to to start to offset the liability, and that number is four hundred eleven thousand one hundred eighteen dollars. Now there will be some people who want to be really clever about this and say, well, you should only really fund two thirds of it or something because. Somebody's going to figure something out. The problem is, is that everybody else has problems that dwarf ours in magnitude, in my opinion, right? The state is in an even worse hole, and the feds are the worst of all. So the problem with that calculus is I'm not sure who this is going to roll downhill to. Um, and then the second thing is we are so we have such an enormous liability that we could pay this number for a lot of years and really still not nibble away at it. So again, this goes to the concept of matching, right? We're, we're, we're creating liabilities that we're just passing on. The, the number is getting larger every year. And so, again, in my opinion, as, you know, unlike free cash, this is something where there's been a lot of conversation in town, and we absolutely should be doing this. This seems like a no-brainer to me. Anyway, so questions from the board? Um, Mr. Catino. No, this one. This one uh, we had explained very well to us uh, when uh, the uh, people from the state came in, and, mm. and it's uh, it's something we really do have to look at. Okay, Mr. Mosier. So I'll go back to my earlier comment, just just to understand how far does our dollar go, depending on where we put it. I mean, right now lending's fairly inexpensive. I'm going to assume that our OPEB liabilities exceed. Uh, the rate is exceeding that of lending. And so if we were to pay down maybe some more, well, not necessarily all of free cash by any stretch, but maybe double up or something like that, how much more would we cut down our liability? Right. Investing money earlier will reduce your long-term liability because obviously the money compounds for longer. So you're, you're exactly right on that. 
unless you lose the money. So I guess yeah, I I'd like to know what that looks like. You know, if we're saving four percent over, you know, if our debt service on the life of the school loan is is X, and we save three times X by paying our debt down on OPEB, I'd be interested in looking at that. Okay, um, uh, Mr. Sistari. Yeah, I mean, you know, this is the right thing to do. Um, you know, this is all about this is all about uh, paying your debts, right? Um, not not being responsible and funding this uh, funding OPEB would really be akin to uh, taking out a giant mortgage uh, when you know you're you're going to pass away and you can never pay off the mortgage and you don't have anybody else who's going to be paying off the bank and all of a sudden it goes into foreclosure and all of that um, you know so it's it's really a matter of paying your debts and. It's the people who are here today being served by our public servants uh, in town, the people who are working at Town Hall, the people who are working uh, in all the other areas of, of uh, town services and town government. Um, it's the services that they're providing today that are, you know, basically contributing to this uh, future debt, if you will, uh, that, that we've all incurred. And so we need to, we need to do this. Okay. And Mr. Hur. Assuming the free cash is there, I would support this one. Okay. Uh, article set. So again, we'll, um, I'm going to not take a vote on that one just because we don't actually know if we have the money yet. And so I think, so I think the consensus has been noted, but, um, but we might as well, I'd, I'd rather get the money first and then figure it out. Uh, article 7 pays to go $966,000, almost $967,000 worth of, uh, of a hodgepodge of things. Mr. Mosier, you had a question? I did, Mr. Chairman. For Mr. Westerling, on the uh, loader-mounted snowblower, mm -hmm. see the logic for for purchasing one. If, if I recall, the number was around a hundred or one hundred and ten thousand for that. Fifteen. Fifteen. The chair, I've got one hundred and fifteen thousand. Was our last yeah. estimate. So I guess I guess my only question is 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 that is that going to exceed what what we're likely going to need? Is there Something that we don't have that's less expensive is is or are we are we gearing up for something that you would have up in the Arctic? Where does this fall in the grand scheme of what we need versus what this is? Well, Mike, destroy any more retaining walls with it. Yeah, right. Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman. A as an example, last year for snowblower rentals, we spent nearly thirty-two thousand dollars for snowblower rentals to help widen our roadways. Last winter was an extraordinary winter; it was record-setting. We don't know what the next 10 years, which is the approximate life of the snowblower, what that will bring. But if it brings anything similar, we would use that uh, for widening existing roadways to help with snow removal downtown, to help with widening the parking areas, the schools. It's a, truly a multifunctional tool that will be used throughout the winter. So regardless of, uh, you know, if we have two feet or five feet, you see this being useful. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, as an example, nearly every time we get a substantial snow, we have to go to the downtown area and remove all the snow for the convenience and parking of, of the, the folks that are visiting downtown. This will greatly expedite that <coughs> removal of snow and, and reduce our overtime costs in that alone. All right. Great. Okay. Thank you for the thorough explanation. You're welcome. Mr. Har. Me? Yep. Oh, boy. What the heck is this? We talked a month ago about opening up a warrant and saying we want to talk about a school and we want to talk about as few other articles as possible. Okay? And then uh, we heard that Parks and Rec was really trying to move to put the building together with the other work they were doing at Fruit Street. Okay, maybe there's a little logic there with the economies of scale and the time value of money. We'll get to that one. Whatever, we'll deal with that. Uh, and then we talk about a road where the cause of the retaining wall is collapsing, it's a public safety issue. I'm like, okay, so now we're up to four or five articles. And then we've got a couple of small little things where we're moving some money around, you know, for personal protection equipment and some other things. But we got a million eight thrown in that one. And then we come to this article. And I'm saying all this tongue in cheek, Mr. Kamala, as you know, I'm having a little fun here. But this is town meeting 101. 
Well, this was all in the warrant, but couldn't get funded, right? Because we didn't have free cash. So this is the exact same article, I believe, Mr. Kamal. Is there anything different from the annual town meeting warrant? No. Nope. This is just the stuff we had to pull off the town meeting warrant that they wanted then because we didn't have the free cash to pay for it. Understood, but we're not advertising this special town meeting being the annual purchase of police cruisers. And that's what we're doing here. Looks like we're buying two police cruisers, and we're buying 50 grand worth of radios, and we're buying. You know, we're, we're doing a lot of the annual uh, typical Mr. stuff. Mr. Hurd, the, 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 the town meeting is being advertised with the warrant. So the warrant is there for people to, to yeah. see what's being taken up. Technically, yes. In theory or in... You it's know. certainly not the marquee item. And I agree with you that it looks a bit hypocritical, uh, the fact that we had a discussion and we were saying, let's keep this bare bones. Let's just do what's needed for the schools. Let's keep everybody else from putting any additional articles. I agree with you 100% there. And then we've put, you know, what, at least four or five articles uh, on here. Um, it, it certainly, in my estimation, coming out of the annual town meeting, it was expected that we would be doing this, provided we thought that we would have free, uh, free cash certified by then. So it's not a shock to me. I don't think it's going to be a shock to a lot of people uh, when, when they see this. Um, but I understand what you're saying, what the optics are of it. So through the chair. Well, Mr. Hurd has got yeah, the just, floor. Yeah, I just wanted to. Just collecting myself, thank you. Okay, so fine. So while <laughs> he, just while he comments, I just ahead. wanted to clarify, Mr. Hurd, so I understand. Your, your concern is that we're doing <coughs> annual town meeting business at a special town meeting. Yes. That, was, that had been that's advertised. Good. That's a million dollars worth of spending. That's been my concern. publicized by the board as being a minimal warrant that would deal with the school. Yeah, and I haven't heard one person ask me about this other million dollars that we're proposing to spend at this town meeting. Everyone's asking me about the school, and a few people are asking about Fruit Street. But now we've got a whole other million dollars worth of stuff here that I get. I'm not arguing that's the merits of some of these. I'm just the process is really, I think, troubling. But uh, I don't know. Who voted to sign this warrant? Sorry? Who voted to sign this warrant? I know. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> I wasn't here. <laughs> so do you have a, do you have a, uh, um, I'm not trying to be facetious. I mean, do you, have a, do you have a question about any of these things, or do you just want to talk, I mean, do you want to just <laughs> contemplate the, the larger question, which I, which I grant you is, is valid? I just think we have to be ready for town meeting when we get to this article to want to address why this article is on this meeting. Mm -hmm. And I think there's some logical answers to that, uh, but then I think the advocates for each of these uh, each of these items that in the past have all been individual articles on their own, mm -hmm. uh, people better be ready to speak up and stand their ground because I think there's going to be a few energized people in the audience. I think the only argument here would be this was stuff that the people needed then. They say they still need now. We just didn't have the funding mechanism for it. And we got to be ready so, for that. But to your point. None of this was vetted at a town meeting because the article I don't think ever got discussed because there was no money to pay for it. So this, it isn't, you're, you have an excellent point in that, in that this, it isn't like this is the list we went through at town meeting and everyone said, yeah, we're here right. for it, and then we decided we had no money. I, it never actually came up. So we actually don't know what people would have said. Mr. Kamal, you look, do you have something to say on that? Um, I just wanted to clarify, Mr. Hay. Uh, the town has had a pay-as-you-go article which combines standard articles or items that the town purchases on a regular basis? For a couple of years. Um, more, than, more than two years. Yeah, and we always hear about it, right? And now, we're in my view, we're going to really hear about it because it's now in a special. Yeah. I understand what you're saying, but anyway, yeah. okay. I'm all set. Thanks. Yeah. Ms. Coutinho. The only, uh, I, I started it. You started it. I'm, I'm losing it tonight. Mr. Sistari. So we're only going to get 10 years out of a $115,000 snowblower? Yeah, especially once we get our new DPW shed and people are washing it down after every use. Waxing. We'll get more. Absolutely. Okay, great. Mr. Kamal, do you have something to add to this? I, not necessarily this topic, but I wanted to clarify a, a question that had been raised uh, earlier on the stabilization funds. Okay. General stabilization fund, $1.986 million. Capital stabilization fund, currently at 251000 OPEP Trust Fund, 357000 Oh, it's less than $2 million. Okay, that's, that's much less than I thought it was. Yeah. I, thought it was yeah. I thought it was higher than that. All right, so in that case, it's still an interesting conversation, but it's, 
it makes more sense to continue to put money into it, in my opinion. Okay. All right, so does anybody have any questions on, on Article Number, uh, any of the items on Article Number 7? This is a challenge, Mr. Kamala, right? Because um, I assume the board was in, I don't even know what the board voted last time to support all, whether the board was in favor of all these articles or not, these items or not. We voted to close the warrant. And we didn't get into any I'm of I'm saying in the annual town meeting, I don't, I don't remember oh. what our position was on all this stuff. I assume we were in favor of it, but <clears throat> we'll have to see what comes through. Mr. Chairman, if I recall that we were held back on a police cruiser. See, I had the opposite recollection. I thought, I thought that, well, there were, I remember there was some discussion about it. I thought there was Chief three and we went there was for two. One because there was another lieutenant yeah. coming on. And yeah. I, I, thought th I think he'd look for three and we gave him two. I just don't Maybe know that what was it is. So, okay. So this is an article that we may, I mean, Austin, Mr. Hurd, your point, we may just not get there in any of this stuff. Mr. Kamala. For the record. Annual town meeting, the board voted unanimously to support pay as you go. All these articles? Yes. Okay. So this was the list we did. I mean, I'm not saying we did that. I just didn't actually this remember. This has not changed. Okay. So all the stuff we were in favor of. Okay. Good. Thank you. Uh, okay. So I'm going to wait on a vote for that until, um, until we know as well um, where the money is. And then Article 8 is Fruit Street Indoor Recreational Facility, um, $500,000. Um, we've not heard from Parks and Rec on this one, right? They didn't ever present to us previously on it? Yeah, they, no, they, did. they, yeah, they did. Did they, they come did. in? Okay. They came in. Okay. So, um, Mr. Coutinho, you, you got any questions on this one for, uh, I, yeah, the well, problem uh, is the proponent's not here. Yeah, I, yeah I, just, I just see this one as uh, it, 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 it puts the, the two halves of the building up at the same time as opposed to building temporary walls, temporary structures. And then, and then going after it, uh, going after it later on. This just allows the, the uh, the entire facility to be built um, correctly once, and not have two setup times and have it uh, actually cost more money. Okay, Mr. Sestari. Uh, I, I support this, but I do not support doing this and approving. Uh, you know, and I know that it's such a preliminary stage right now, but I don't support trying to do this and also an artificial field at the high school for the football field at the same time. Uh, I think these things can be spread out a little bit more. I think we need to evaluate what the town's priorities are if, if that's the kind of thing that we're going to be bringing all together in one year. Okay. Mr. Mosier. So through the chair, I'm, I'm in Mr. Sestari's camp. I don't want to hold this up because I know it's <clears throat> held up for for various reasons at the last town meeting. Um, I did see a letter from a resident uh, talking mm -hmm. about unmaintained parks and rec equipment, uh, things like that. So I, I support this article, but just sort of generally, I'd like to have a broader question about parks and rec and their budget. We've talked about that a little bit about um, their mm -hmm. enterprise fund and okay. we should probably do it as an agenda item at some point. So I'm good with it. Yeah. Mr. Herr. I think based on some of the input we've got from residents specific to Mr. Mosier's point, how things are being maintained in town are going to come up at town meeting or special town meeting when this article comes up. Uh, I'd be surprised if people don't go to the microphone and talk about those concerns. So I think it'll be before we get to an agenda item on our agenda or our meetings uh, that will come up. And I think it's something that should be discussed. I support uh, the idea of uh, sort of finalizing what the Fruit Street complex is going to look like now uh, instead of sort of breaking it up. Um, but I do recognize the concerns people have across the community about the different facilities and how they are being maintained. I spend my time personally at Fruit Street. I know other folks are in a different stage with the kids and they're over at EMC and other people are at Sandy Park or uh, Sandy Beach and you know we spent a lot of money on a lot of these different things and uh, sometimes I go down there and I'm frankly disappointed, you know, when the opposing team walks up and there's trash all over Fruit Street. That bothers me. Uh, and I think we have to put a plan in place and put some accountability into that plan to whomever is going to be maintaining these facilities to do them well. Not just do them on occasion when someone barks about it, but do them routinely. And if it's the DPW, then they're going to be the ones. And we'll, if they need some money to get it done, we've got to find that out. If we spent $3 million in these Fruit Street fields, and we're going to go spend another whatever this is, and yet we let the place get trashed, 
I mean, that's ridiculous. So we've got to, I think, get better at managing the overall uh, maintenance and upkeep of these facilities as part of the discussion, but I, in terms of the article itself, I support it. Okay. okay. I'm not in favor of this one. I think we've gotten too far ahead of ourselves on, the, on all this stuff. I think Fruit Street is terrific as it is. I don't, think we, I don't think this is a need to have, and I'd rather allocate the resources to other places. And I'm also equally concerned that we've gotten, we've gotten way too f into much into building things as opposed to maintaining things. And I think I haven't been to EMC in years, but from what I understand, it's not doing so well. And I'm just, I think, I think we, um, we're enamored of new construction. And I'd ra I, don't, I don't know why we have a, a driving need for this structure. So I'm, I'm, I don't see this as being a requirement in town today. And, and to your point, if I had to make a choice, I'd much rather have a turf field to high school, which we'll get more use out of, and, and I think it's more of a benefit for the overall community. Okay. Um, so we can vote this one. So, uh, so before we vote it, then if we're going to vote it, I think it may be a counter to that position. It's a safety issue at Fruit Street, uh, I think. When a storm rolls in and there's kids down there and mom and dad went off shopping and they're coming back to get them, I mean, there's, it's a little bit of a free fall. There's been a couple of scary moments down there over the years, and I think this is a safety concern as much as anything else. Um, I, think it's, I, I, think it's, I think it's a safety issue, but I also think it's an investment for the community that uh, will re give a return to the taxpayers. It's not just building another building. I think it's completing an athletic complex that is really nice when it's picked up. It is really nice when it's well maintained, and you hear about that from visiting uh, teams and parents and so forth. Uh, but it's not complete yet. There's not facilities there of any kind. There's not a safety building for people to get into when a storm comes in. There's no storage. You know, well, gonna be, that's going to the first part is going to have storage. This is just the this is just the back half. The, the first part's going to have the correct. storage, the bathrooms. It's going to have all the highest value things: the storage, the bathrooms, and the concession stand are in the part that got approved. This is the mega sort of the gym. you know gym thing in back of it. If you're talking about safety, there's I don't know that I buy that art, that assertion that this is necessary for safety. I throw the safety into the yeah, front no, portion too. I understand what you're saying. And then I also I I also am. Frankly, to Mr. you know, not to not to drag Mr. Mosher into this unwillingly, but I am unclear about the finances of Parks and Rec. I do think that Fruit Street. I'm I'm not convinced the economics of that have been what they were supposed to be, and I'm worried about the fact that we're wearing out fields, you know, 10 percent a year that are going to have to be redone at some point, and I'm not. And they were supposed to set up a sinking fund for that, and I'm not confident that's actually been done. So I'm not, I'm not convinced that there's a. Um, I don't have a level of comfort about the Parks and Rec situation right now that makes me feel like this is a necessary investment this time. And I also don't know how much more expensive it would be to do it later. I mean, so I, I'm i sure it'll be gorgeous. I don't have any doubts it would be a great asset to the community. Um, this just feels like we're pushing a little too far, for my taste at least. Um, but, you know, and I'm not saying anything new. Okay. But I mean, that's sort of where I am in this whole thing. So, um, so Arcle 8, we can vote... Uh, do we have an appropriations committee recommendation on this yet? I don't believe we have a recommendation yet. From okay. So I don't know if folks want to wait until appropriations votes, or if people just want to support it. It does, you know, or make a decision now. It's really. Um, uh, so through the chair. So my misunderstanding. So I didn't realize. So so refresh my memory. What passed at town meeting? What passes? This is a this is a structure, and I don't have the picture. And if John can do it better, yeah, the CPC passed it. Which is a concept, which is a front part of the building has a concession stand, it has bathrooms, and it has storage, to my recollection. And then in back of that, they wanted to build, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, but sort of like another, like an indoor athletic space, right? Of of, of non-trivial size. But this would actually be see the we the, the storage space would be filled with storage. Like to, to to Mr. Hurst's point, you know, we, this this would be the area where people ran into. The storage area is still. It's gonna be full. It's gonna be full, exactly. Yeah, of stuff. You know, I mean, so and there might be a concession stand, and there might be the bathrooms, but you can't fit two teams worth of of, of kids and spectators and everything in. So this this this. Um, they built it backwards. Will be um, indoor an indoor uh, athletic facility as well as that 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 safety area. 
Um, it just com it actually completes the whole building. It's you know, it, and, and we're talking about the the, oh, thank the, you. the it's the back of it. the back three quarters or something, right, yeah, John? Is we, that yeah, about we're right? We're talking about the timing of it. You know, it, you know, it's it's sort of like when we talk about uh, you know having a team put together. You know, you, you want to win while Brady's still on the team. You know, while you still have the team put together, if we build up half of it and and we've got the, the, we've got the fields there, well, we're going to build the other half when the fields wear out. You know, let's 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 strike while the iron's hot while we have the entire uh, package. We'll put it together and 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 be a destination for all of these. Uh, well, but, but, but one thing, you know, to uh, Mr. Palaco and Mr. Mosier's points, that point when the fields wear out, that's, that's not intended to be another hit to the taxpayers. That's supposed to be something that's been, uh, you know, they've been getting revenue for rental of these fields through over a 10-year period, and that's supposed to fund the replacement of the turf. So that, that should not be you know, theoretically be a concern, and that's something that we need to find out about in more detail. You know, as far as, as, far as safety versus athletic center, you know, obviously building something for safety is not going to cost you the same amount per square foot as an athletic center. Agreed. Um, and, I, I mean, I, 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 am, I am going to waffle a bit on this uh, from, from my earlier uh, statement. And I start to I start to think to myself, okay, so who's going to be practicing in this, and when? You know, is this so that our 12-year-olds can be the best gosh darn soccer players in the 12-year-old league across the state? Is this for high school kids to be playing lacrosse in when it's rainy? Um, you know, is it is it situations where they really just can't practice outside in the rain? Um, you know, what's the purpose of it? And I'd like to know it's self-supporting. I'd like to know the economics are, are covered here, right? I mean, I think, I, I think if this is a half million bucks, we get the, I, I, this ties into a lot of questions I have. I mean, listen, Parks and Recs are phenomenal, right? They're, it's been a great committee. They've, they're visionary. I, they're aggressive. I love, I love all about it. It's, it's, it feels like it's a little bit over its skis right now, and I, I'm just a little nervous about what we're doing here from an economic standpoint. Maybe the right answer is, Mr. Kamal, do we think we could get the Parks and Recs folks to come to yeah. sit down with us before a town, special town meeting and talk about this? Yes. Or at least, you know, to spend a few minutes to talk about exactly what we're going to get for the half million bucks, why it has to be now, and... Special town meeting's right. Monday. I know that. Well, we're going to have to. We're going to post a way early meeting oh, on Monday. Early, yeah. We have to because half these things we don't even have That's the answers right. for. Okay. So, I mean, this we're going to have to post a really early Sketch. meeting on Monday. Yes, yeah, clear account, clear the decks on Monday because it's going to be a long pre-meeting. Um, well, again, if people want to vote it, I mean, the motion's there. If people want to vote it, I'll, I'll take a vote now. I my preference would be to get more information and to give Parks and Rec an opportunity. To yeah, speak. I'd love to hear from Parks and Rec and not okay. us all here together. But while Mr. Westerling is here, can we yeah. try and address this other question? And I know it's a big question, but just fundamentally, Parks and Rec is responsible for developing, maintaining facilities and growing programs or man managing the programs. This goes to the trash sure. pickup stuff? Yes, yeah, this yeah. just goes to general maintenance. But does Parks and Rec then employ or utilize DPW to get that done? Mr. Westerling? The question is, at peak times, right, we've all seen there, you go to Fruit Street and it's a garbage dump on Sunday afternoon when, on these peak times, right? Why does that happen? Uh, Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> the DPW picks up trash every Friday and every Monday okay. from all the recreational facilities. Right. So Friday afternoon, there's no trash in the barrels, there's right. nothing there. If there's a major soccer event, as an example, that runs yeah. three days, the trash is full come Saturday. Right. And we had a situation like that maybe maybe a month ago where we got a call from uh, Parks and Rec folks saying we need to empty the trash. We explained to them that it was emptied. So we've met with uh, Mr. Gulfy, the Parks and Recreation Manager, uh, Director, and we told him that we need to have advance notice of when there's going to be a lot of people there. Then we can appropriately schedule overtime for us to go and empty the trash on Saturday yeah. and Sunday. And who and pays for that? Does Parks and Rec reimburse you for that overtime? We, at the end of the fiscal year, we send an invoice for an estimate of the DPW's time spent uh, cleaning the facilities, trash, uh, and, and grass uh, cutting. 
And I don't believe that that's part of it. That would just come out of our normal DPW over time. Is that an excessive burden for you? Having, I mean, we also don't want to have you shortchange the rest of the town because you got to pick up trash. I mean, so this is not a big number, I guess, is what I'm trying to confirm. But no, the, pr sir. the problem, in my view, is not the cans at the curb where people are coming and picking up and doing their thing on Friday and Monday. It's everywhere on the fields. If you've been down there lately, there's about 3,000 articles. Well, I'm being facetious. There's about 35 articles of clothing just lying along the fence. There's 28 water, bo water bottles lying along the fence. There's trash up and down. If you walk out to the far corners of the fences where the wind blows at all, it's piling up inches deep back there. We need to get somebody out of the trucks and to go for a walk. Now, the people that rent the fields are supposed to do that, and we need to start holding them accountable too. But if we have to change the staffing to get a couple of high school kids once or twice a week to walk, to, to walk not just Fruit Street, but EMC, Sandy B, all the places, I think that's got to be part of what we want. If we want to have the best facilities we can, we need to maintain them better. And I think that requires a different model for how we're going to do it. Is it reasonable to expect your folks to do that, or do we need to come to some separate accommodation with Parks and Rec? Like, what's, Mr. what's, Mr. what should we look, be looking for? Sorry, didn't mean to step on you, Mr. Chairman. Right, I, I think that it's it's unreasonable to think that on a, on a Friday <laughs> afternoon that the DPW employees, the two or three that are there, are going to walk the yeah. perimeter. That's, that's clearly responsibility of the coaches that are yeah. there, the, the parents that are there, the, the, the athletes that are there. But none of them are going to do it. So who's, not who, happening. who's, who's oh, getting paid? Well, and, and, also, and also, you know, they're not throwing that stuff into the woods. A lot of times it's because on those busy weekends, you know, the, the barrels get full and then the wind blows right. and now it's in the woods. Right. And, you know, that's, you know, you, you can only expect so much of a coach. He's not going to get in the barrel and start stomping it down. Um, you know, and so this is, this is one of those things that there's got to be a solution. We just have to figure it out. But I'll also say that I think that that's outside the four corners of what we're discussing in this meeting. You're exactly right. And, and, so I, and I don't want to go too far. But I, but I do think Parks and Rec has a job. But there, I think some of this goes beyond their, thing, their, their purview, right? We need well, to help we everybody here. expect from them. I think the problem is Parks and Rec owns the fields. You know, and I, we have no way to force them well, to do what we, we want, to right? We went, now we went to the woods. No, I know. I'm, but he, I, I let it go, and it's my fault. But, I mean, it, um, uh, so, yes, we have to find a better solution. It is definitely not far outside the four corners of, this, of what we're talking about. But, but I don't think the DP, this is the DPW's fault. Oh, I'm not saying it's anybody's fault. I, I said if we have to change the model to get this kind of work done, we have to, I think we need to change the so model. I think this has to come from Parks and Rec. Go ahead. So through the chair, who's the liaison to Parks and Rec? Tab, maybe you can just get on the agenda for one of the meetings and sort of bundle all this stuff together and just yeah. see what they want to come back with. Let's work together to find what we all think is a solution. Right. right. Okay. All right, so we're going we're gonna to hold on this article, voting this article as well. We're going to invite Parks and Rec to come in and let, give them their, their time and have them explain some of the stuff. And, Ms. Kamal, I think you have to go to the question of what are we getting here, why does it have to happen now, and, again, there's these larger issues of what is the economic model here, why is the town buying all this? Um, um, and, to be, and, and, again, if the trade-off is this versus a turf field to high school, I'd much rather have a turf field to high school. Um, I think so. Okay. Uh, Article 9, vehicle purchase, Mr. Kamal. Um, uh, why is this such a critical item to come before a special town meeting? <coughs> Based on my discussions with uh, the principal assessor, I believe this, uh, this will not be moving forward. Uh, okay, so does the board need to vote it, or should the board this assume? At this point, the board should hold off voting on this. Hold off. So we're going to hold off in anticipation of this one going away. Mm. Article 10, uh, I think we've, that's already been determined that there's going to be no action taken on that one, right? Yes, please. So the board does not have to vote on that one. And then a zoning bylaw amendment, this again sits outside the board's um, general uh, deliberations. But does anybody feel strongly about this one? No. Okay. If, if for the board's information, we just received an email uh, report from uh, Elaine Lazarus that the planning board voted not to support this request. Okay. So that one's. So that closes out the warrant with. Um, with a lot of stuff to get finished. We got we got a super we got a super tight schedule here rolling into special town meeting. This is gonna be a stressful the next four days. So we, yeah, everybody should plan on <laughs> being being in a meeting at lunch <laughs> to be able to get through all this stuff before a special town meeting. Mr. Kamalo, what's wrong? 
How do I say this? I, I had to impose on the board, but the board may consider even meeting on a Saturday, on this coming Saturday, uh, just to get. So it Syracuse happen. is playing Pitt, and I'm going to go watch Pitt beat up on Syracuse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Both five I'm one. sensing a reluctance. To ask. Let's see what we got. Let's see what we get for numbers. And let's see. Um, I mean, we got a lot of stuff to do, but I think we're just going to have to meet super early before time. Special time meeting is a simple answer. Your family time is too important, Mr. Kamal. See, Michigan's off this weekend, so I'm free on Saturday. So it's, it's, <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. So we'll let's revisit. We'll we'll, we'll 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 plan on Monday, but we'll see what happens. Okay, that's everything. Um, I think just taking sure there's nothing I forgot. What about the budget stuff? Was that tabled for we Oh, yeah. So items 10 and 11 we pulled off because we just don't have enough yet. We don't have enough on the revenue side to have revenue discussion. There's just gotcha. entirely too many open items. And then the policy statement, um, well, ba basically there's a lot of information we haven't still gathered. And rather than and it was clearly going to go into the next meeting if we started tonight, so I decided I'd rather just hold off and do it the next um, one, the next meeting we have more data. I think Mr. Moj would prefer we continue tonight and try and get it wrapped up. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, on that note, chairman, I take a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. <laughs> so moved. We have a motion and a second for a discussion. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed, present, not voting. That's